I'm 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 deeply rooted American. Like I'll 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 fight in a civil war. I'll I'll you know I'll defend it till its end. I'm 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 not one of those like I'm moving to Canada people. Um, yeah, I'm that... kind of with you, man. Like I I'd be down to defend the rights of Americans yeah. for sure, even though I'm not American. I mean, I might be soon if I end up marrying my girlfriend or something. Welcome to the Mr. Bill Podcast. I'm Bill's manager, Anand Harsh, editor-in-chief of the Unst.com, and I do these intros because Bill hates doing them. We've got an excellent episode for fans this week. Bill chats with Ben Jordan, a.k.a. The Flashbulb, who's an IDM and instrumental icon. The pair cover existentialism, economics, mental illness, and of course, COVID-19 in a freewheeling conversation that reaches almost three hours. I'll get you right into it since it's such a hefty episode, but I do want to mention that The Flashbulb appeared on the first Beleagal Beats compilation that launched the label over a year ago. You can find that comp at beleagalbeats.bandcamp.com. A special thanks to all the patrons who keep us in jeans and Taco Bell. Subscribers to the Mr. Bill Patreon get episodes a full week before listeners of the free feed, and early access is available to listeners at all subscription levels. Patrons can also get bonus episodes, merch, Discord roles, and so much more. Just head over to patreon.com slash Tunes to support the show. Finally, go to MrBillsTunes.com to sign up as a hardcore Abletoneer. You get full access to Bill's project files and tutorials, as well as sample packs and a bunch of other stuff. It's quite the deal. All right, here's the hefty-sized episode of the Mr. Bill podcast with The Flashbulb. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you are listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're 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 listening to the Mr. yeah well cool man thanks for coming on the podcast again i appreciate it yeah yeah virtually this time so you've been doing them all well, obviously you've been doing them all virtual right yeah so when i start when quarantine started i was like oh, i'll just put the podcast on hold because one of the things i said to myself when i started the podcast was i never really want to do them virtually because um i don't know it's just it's a lot you have a lot different of a conversation i feel like in person than you do online mm-hmm. uh, yeah. but i don't know it's it's actually turn- and so i was like stubborn at first and then eventually i was like oh fuck it i'll i'll start doing them because i kind of want to do something with my time and yeah it's, it's been working out pretty well honestly yeah it, it's it's funny because i was actually thinking about that um recently i was like because i because i do get asked you know every now and then i get asked to do podcasts ver- but i probably get more virtual podcast requests than real ones because i don't really see that many humans in real life pandemic or not and uh it's kind of funny because i i think to myself i get the benefit of not having a virtual podcast is that someone can't have a cheat sheet like and and that's that's why video is good i suppose like video is good because i i can't just like have a notebook like if i'm like reading you know answering a question or talking about something going over facts i i, I wonder about that like if you ever get into like a challenging conversation or something it's being there in real life is probably much more transparent. Yeah, exactly. Cause it's, well, that, um, that's something I think about uh, a lot as well. Like people, uh, back in the day, you know, like 20 years ago or whatever, when you were in conversation, you could kind of just say shit and yeah. no one could like call you out on it other than it would just be like your word against the other person. Right. Unless somebody had like yeah. encyclopedia Britannica or some shit next to them. Yeah. Well, what were those encyclopedias that used to exist um, in libraries? Uh, was it encyclopedia? Right. Yeah, no, I, I, we had one. My my grandparents got, got sold on one from like literally a door-to-door encyclopedia salesman. <laughs> and they ended up like buying one for however many hundreds of dollars where we would get like, I remember like once every two weeks or something, we got like a package and it would be like A, and then we'd get B, and then C. <laughs> and then we'd be like, ah, oh, D's coming soon. We're going to learn about dogs or you know whatever so it's just weird weird to even think about now but 
uh, I know a, a shitload about apples, but don't even ask me about bananas. <laughs> right? Yeah. There, there's a uh, there's a really interesting something. Uh, another thing that's sort of relative to this, I was thinking about. Um, we have this huge divide right now where everybody is. It, you just see on social media and uh, places like Twitter and Facebook and stuff, and you, you see people that are just so unable to admit that they're wrong and they just can't deal with being defeated intellectually at all. And they, so what they end up doing is they just end up denying obvious things like the mask thing, right? Like people wearing masks, like people are denying that masks are beneficial to protecting you from pathogens, which is, you know, ludicrous. Like, like who in the right mind would actually come to that thought process by themselves and, and think about it. But if, you know, if you have some sort of narrative and if you've said it because someone else said it or because you had, maybe you had a thought like, no, maybe it's not. And, but then you have to stick to that. And I was thinking maybe the reason for that, maybe people aren't becoming more radicalized. I was thinking maybe it's just the fact that humans are not used, they're not used to being fact checked in real time, 24 hours a day. Like we're just not emotionally prepared to deal with that. Like, like sort of what you were saying, like in the seventies or eighties, you could just have a conversation with somebody and, and then you'd have this, like, like when I was a kid, like if I were a teenager, we, we'd be like, you know, smoking pot and talking about, uh, you know, I guess anything like that. Like, let's just say that came up, like do masks actually, or do masks actually prevent you from getting a disease? And then we would have a little conversation about it for 30 minutes and then, you know, and then just sort of leave it. But now, you know, Immediately, somebody's like, well, here's a white paper. And then <laughs> the other person's just defeated and they, and they have to like slaughter their ego in front of, you know, risking ostracization from their friends and from the people they were, you know, disagreeing with. They have to like then choose between slaughtering their ego or digging their heels into something that was already ridiculous. And it's like, and this is, this is society right now. Like, this is like the recipe for pretty much every disagreement that you have politically right and then the uh the end game of that is uh people just stop being reductive towards other people's feelings and stuff like that they're like yeah well you're a snowflake or whatever right yeah yeah and, and they, they call like, each other the, the exact same name right right they, they just take like everything the person just said and just like reduce it down to a word like triggered or something like that right yeah yeah triggered triggered is a, a huge one that yeah that's that's one that like started as a thing that they called liberals and and now everybody's just calling everybody triggered yeah well it's called there's a name for it it's called the post-truth era of politics like we've hmm. we're we've been in that for i think that started in like 2014 or something and we've been in that i mean there's a wikipedia page for it and everything that's an actual phenomenon that's happening where uh, uh basically it, they don't know like some people believe that there's a narrative to it that you know that uh have you ever seen have you ever seen the film or heard of the film hypernormalization uh no it's a uh, it's a uh, oh god i i'm not going to google it cuz that that would be going against exactly what i just said about having a cheat sheet when you're podcasting <laughs> but um god it's by a really credible bbc journalist um but it's a youtube documentary he just makes documentaries that he wants everybody to see in his spare time and uh and it, it's about his and it all of it checks out pretty well, and it's basically just about how not fake news is getting more and more popular, and that started happening in Russia, and that was like a good way of uh, ignoring, like basically with everybody being like, well, Putin killed this person because they disagreed. This person committed suicide, and Putin actually killed him. People would have that argument instead of having an argument about the crumbling infrastructure in the country. And the country couldn't handle the crumbling infrastructure, so they just had people arguing about these things until they got completely numb to arguing. And that's kind of what's happening here. Like, when was the last time you heard about Flint's, the fact that Flint doesn't have drinking water? You know, Flint, is Michigan. That, is that still a thing? Yeah. Yeah, that's not been solved. And and it's like, yeah, I mean, it, there's so many, so many issues, and especially with, like, COVID-19. If anything, it's like turned me more into a anarchist than anything, like just by the incompetence of government. And so it's yeah, it's interesting. Did you see the uh, that giant uh, explosion in Beirut today? Yeah, well, that was yesterday, right? 
I think yeah, yesterday or today, this uh, it was like an ammonium, uh, ammonium something. nitrate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a big just factory, dude. That shit looked insane. Yeah, supposedly it was like. I don't know. I, I've, I've the two things that I heard was one that it was a Russian. There's literally like a, a Russian ship that just broke down that they left there that was full of ammonium nitrate, and they just sort of like left it and nobody cleaned it up. And then the other one, I saw a picture of ammon- ammonium nitrate stuffed into like the bottom of a building, like just being stored there. Either one is like insane. Like you yeah, know. they both seem avoidable. Yeah, to say the least, yeah. Yeah, but just, yeah, ammonium nitrate is not the best thing to keep stockpiled in the bottom of your giant building. But, uh, yeah, one thing I read is I've, I've read a couple different things where people were just saying that, like, COVID saved their life. Like, because otherwise they would have been at work downtown or otherwise they would have been, you know, like that the, the death toll and injury toll is actually a bit lower because people, because it's just not as crowded as it usually is, but... Mm. Do you think COVID, like, if you minus out the fact that it's killing a bunch of people um, and just take the circumstantial stuff, which is everyone has to stay at home, do you think it's a net positive thing or a negative thing for humanity as a whole? Definitely negative. Um, I think it's sort of like what we were talking about where you have, like, where people just get really tribal I feel I we have both the economic and the health issues. Like both are real things and both are things that result in people dying, you know? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. Economic issues do kill people. Like the, I don't I don't remember what the quote is, but every time the stock market loses a thousand points, you know, so many thousand people die. Um cuz that's that's homelessness and joblessness and starvation and all those things. And so yeah, the great depression did take a lot of lives as well. So it's like I think it's I think it's a really bad thing because like if we it, even it, minus out the economic thing though I, I think I'm just talking about like if you if you minus out like all the negative things and just took the fact that people have to stay at home um hmm. which is it's like a hard hypothetical to think about I suppose but yeah would you consider that to be a positive thing for people I'm sure everybody's learning something about themselves throughout this process um, yeah, well, the reason I ask is because, um, well, I guess it kind of leads into the stuff that we said we we're going to talk about before yeah. this podcast, which is like mental health issues and stuff like that. And um, just personally, on my end, I just noticed that uh, being in isolation just like uncovered a shitload of problems for me that were no, being ma- well, they were being masked by <clears throat> uh, normalized drug use through touring and just traveling mm-hmm. all the time. And then, yeah. like, ego stroke shit through playing shows all the time. Yeah. Uh, so it was just, like, and and also just distractiveness, like, just being able to distract myself constantly with, like, socializing, essentially. Yeah. Even though I wasn't, like, social, it didn't feel like I was socializing a ton, but, like, I suppose I was because I was traveling all the time. But even when you travel all the time, you feel kind of alone because you're, like, not really having, like, big meaningful interactions with a lot of people, right? It's like you're just seeing fucking people at the airport and talking to air hostesses and talking to bag check people and talking to sure. hotel lobby people and stuff, but it's still a lot of actual socializing. So I guess like all that dis- distractive socializing and stuff sort of masked a bunch of problems for me. Um, but yeah, I think like it's netting, like at least for me, it's it's ending positively in the sense that it's like causing me to solve this problem that I've clearly had for a long time and haven't bothered to, or not haven't bothered to, but like haven't noticed, I suppose, how serious it is. It's, yeah, like, so you it's harder to shove it under a rug, essentially. Yeah, I guess for people listening, to be less like cryptic about it, I, through uh, quarantine, just hit like a massive bout of addiction and depression, essentially. Um, and I mean, I, I've been addicted to things for a long time, right? Which is like, um, originally it was weed and then that transposed into alcoholism, which was the main one and honestly probably still the main one. And then that transposed into another substance that I don't want to name because it's an illegal substance and, uh, or I think it's an illegal sub it, it's an FDA approved substance for certain things. I'll just say it's not heroin or cocaine or methamphetamines. 
no, it's none of those. <laughs> Just uh, anyway. Uh, um, so I got addicted to to that through quarantine. But anyway, uh, essentially, like I realized <clears throat> that all the addiction stuff that I was going through was to solve this problem that I had, which was uh, constant boredom and just mm. persistive like down mood, right? Like just being consistently like low mood and bored, which is weird because I feel like I objectively have interesting and cool shit to do all the time. Like yeah. Make, make music, play with synths, you know, whatever, like a fuck around with Max or something. Like there's just interesting shit for me to be doing that I just wasn't wanting to do because I was just constantly bored. So I was like, this isn't normal. And my girlfriend was like, that's not normal. You should probably talk to a psychiatrist. So I talked to a psychiatrist and they diagnosed me with dysthymia or persistive depression Yeah. because I explained this has been a thing that I've felt for a long time, but it's just been sort of masked by all this other stuff. And they prescribed me <clears throat> um, for the alcoholism naltrexin, which is actually for opiates. Uh, mm -hmm. but it, for some reason helps with alcoholism as well and bupropion, which is, uh, well, <clears throat> yeah. and, uh, or well, which is bupropion yeah. and the generic name. Yeah. And honestly, like I've only been taking bupropion now for about a week, but fuck man, I feel like a million times better than I've felt in like the last few years, I think already. Really? That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to talk to you about this because uh, I don't know if you're wanting to be public about this, but like we can edit whatever out. Sure. But you yeah, said no, you, yeah. you you take bupropion as well, right? Yeah, I take uh, I take Wellbutrin, I take Clonopin, uh, a low dose, zero point five, and that's a benzo. That that's actually that's actually one of the more controversial ones. Like that's more addictive than heroin. A lot of people say um, it's like a. It, Clonopin is Xanax with a longer half-life, essentially. So it's not quite as addictive because it has longer half-life. But um, And then I take Zoloft, um, 50 Which is milligrams. Uh, SSRI, Zoloft. right? That's an SSRI, yeah. And um, so I, I guess I'll start. I guess I might as well just, might as well just tell my story here because I, th I think it's important. Um, I think it's important, especially right now. I think a lot of people are dealing with mental health issues. And well, I I'm think... Uh, Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I'm also interested, like, as, in, as far as your storytelling goes, like how you noticed you had problems. Because for me, having persistive depression, which is kind of like low level, but really long term depression, yeah, which I've, I've just kind of apparent, I guess, had my whole life and not really noticed. Um, and I feel like it's almost better and this sounds weird to have major depression and the reason why i say that is because it's so much easier to diagnose right because your experience is so like divorced from the shit you're having experiencing real in reality right like you might experience something really good but you're crying and you're in bed all the time and that's hmm. really easy to diagnose because you're like this is super fucking abnormal but with persistive depression it's not like it's really difficult to diagnose because it's it's just like persistive low mood and persistive boredom and persistive like inability to concentrate on things and shit like that yeah i think it manifests itself a little bit differently with a lot of different people like uh it, with a lot of people depression like major depression can simply be defined as anger against oneself and so that could actually mask itself as something that almost be could almost be mania or addiction right. or a lot of those things, you know, because somebody could just be like, no, I'm going to the strip club. I'm going to the casino. I'm going to cheat on my wife. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that just because they're constantly trying to be, you know, subconsciously being self-destructive. Right. You um, can chalk it up to other stuff, right? Like, for instance, my inability to concentrate on stuff all the time and be like have this persistent boredom and persistent like inability to to do tasks that I know that I should be doing and just like fuck off and don't do them can all be chalked up to like just a discipline problem, right? Like me just being lazy or something like that. Yeah. Which is like hard to diagnose as a mental health issue because it's easy to just like write it off as, ah, oh, it's just me being fucking lazy. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's uh yeah, there's like the Jordan Peterson way of looking at it where it's like <laughs> where you just have to take responsibility for yourself and you know, but then even Jordan Peterson right now is, you know, under treatment for drug addiction because of is he really? his anxiety issues. Yeah. Like he's he can barely even walk because he had he basically was taking clonopin, 
like loads of it though, and um, ended up going to Russia for treatment and now is apparently possibly permanently disabled as a result of it. Um, is this- so, so much for clean your room or 12 steps. I, I don't mean to be mean. I, I've, I've never really liked the guy because I think he's said some really <laughs> fucked up things, but, um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's terrible what's happening, but at the same time, it's like, what a perfect person to show that you can be vulnerable, that like everybody oh, yeah. has vulnerability. Like the the one person that people look up to, well, I guess the one person that white dudes look up to for uh, personal responsibility and, you know, all that stuff. And he ended yeah. up succumbing to the very thing that he's, you know, saying that you could avoid. So uh, with me... Um, I started taking a, my first like prescription drug for anything. The first time I actually realized there was a problem was when I was about phew, about 15. Um, I just stopped feeling real. <laughs> like, like everything around me just seemed like it was a dream or that it was, you know, and it, it seems like almost, it seems like a very trippy thing, but it's uh it, it it actually is terrifying, especially if it's not drug induced. You know, it's this because uh, you, you start, I guess, especially when you're at that age, you're like, "Am I real? Like, what what does that even mean?" Um, and it kind of the best way. It's so hard to describe, but the best way to describe it is like you can control your body, but not directly. Almost as if it's happening through some sort of remote control system, and everything you're seeing is as if it's on TV or as if it's. Uh, looking through a window or something you, like that. You just feel like very disconnected from reality. Mhm. Yeah. And and that made that essentially made me have panic attacks. Like crazy crazy panic attacks to where there were months where I didn't leave the house. Um and this is when I was like 17 years old. And then this is and this is also weirdly it's like I owe a lot of my music to that too because I that's when I learned how to write music, right? It's like that or I mean that's when I learned how to like produce music by myself the most probably is when I was like staying up for 3 4 days in a row um you know trying to like avoid panic attacks because I didn't feel real. Staying up for 3 or 4 days seems like a terrible way to avoid panic attacks. Yeah, and and it's a terrible way to avoid that like De- derealization and depersonalization feeling. So um, derealization and depersonalization wasn't really on the list of things that psychiatrists would diagnose you for in the late 90s. And so I finally went to a doctor and he prescribed me Zoloft and he said I had panic disorder and that's what I got diagnosed with. And over the years I got diagnosed with um, different things, um, you know, just different uh various some of them some of them made sense some of them didn't schizoid personality disorder was one of them uh depersonalization and derealization was one that eventually kind of became something that you know stuck and now that it's more understood uh and then of course like all of these things cause depression and anxiety and things like that and so uh so yeah, this is the part that I can't that that I can't really speak about, and I can't speak about it because like there's legal implications of me speaking about it at the point at the current time. So I, I can only touch on it. Basically, when when I had a fucked up childhood, uh, like tremendously fucked up periods of my childhood, and in that, I I, I came to understand later in life that much later in life, that the depersonalization and derealization is actually a coping mechanism that happens when it happens to people uh, who have, you know, come come home from war. It's part of, it's like a symptom of PTSD. It's, uh, and mine just sort of stuck and, stuck and I got used to it and I ended up being treated for the things that you could be treated for, like depression and anxiety as a result of it. But I've never really come back and felt real, you know, like it's never happened, which is probably why I, you know, that, that explained for anybody who knows my music that they probably can understand that there's some sort of narrative I've been building for quite a long time with albums called nothing is real and so on. Um, Wait, so you still don't feel real even with the uh, cocktail of medication you're on? No. Yeah. I just don't freak out about it. Oh, <laughs> I just, uh, Yeah. So I, but I still feel, and depending on what happens, depending on the stress I'm under at the time, it can get worse and it could get better. Uh, but I mean, I know now 
that nothing unusual or bad is going to happen as a result of it. Um, I know that the worst thing that could happen is that I don't pay attention when I should, right? So I know that like the worst thing that could happen is if I zone out because of it while I'm driving, that would be a really bad thing to do. So don't do that, you know? <laughs> like, so if I get that feeling really bad, I should probably pull over. Um, and, you know, may maybe don't make serious life-changing decisions if I feel, you know, r if I'm really distracted by that. But other than that, I kind of understand that it just, that's just the way it is. Um, and it's weird because a lot of people, other people who have depersonalization, one of the things that causes it in a lot of people, this wasn't my, the case with me, but one of the things that causes it with a lot of people is uh, marijuana. Like a lot of people, they'll smoke pot once and they'll not feel real and then they'll never feel real again. And Dude, that's the, cra the craziest fucking thing with weed, right, is for some people it can have these insanely awesome anti-anxiety effects and make their body feel really nice and make them feel super calm and make them have patience and be able to think through problems and like just solve a lot of people's problems and that that's a sure huge number of people but yeah other people can smoke at once and have a psychotic episode yeah um yeah that's yeah it's interesting because i i'm i'm very pro legalization of marijuana but yeah likewise because of my own mental health, like I, I think all drugs should be legal. Uh, illegal but should be illegal. Like I think all drugs. I think I don't. I don't think the government should be able to tell you what you can and can't put into your body. I think they could suggest to you what is safe and what's not, and you know, be honest about it. But um, for me, like marijuana legality, it shouldn't be a medical issue. It should be a human rights one. And I actually wish. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a weird thing to say, but I actually kind of wish the pro-legalization world would shut up about medical marijuana um, unless it's coming from a medical researcher or professional uh, because the cognitive dissonance with like cognitive sorry I can't even speak cognitive distance <laughs> why can I say that cognitive dissonance can yeah, you yeah, say that gotta, yeah cognitive Co dissonance. cognitive dissonance all right anyway <laughs> I'm really tired cognitive dissonance I think when you wrap that up with healthcare um, it's super fucking dangerous and when you just have a bunch of people believing that this is the proper way to treat anxiety or this is the proper way to treat cancer or anything like that. And I mean, there are things cannabis does well, like glaucoma treatment, but um, there's evidence that it, for example, there's a lot of evidence that marijuana may help you with chronic pain, right? It won't help you as well as a cortisone shot will help you with chronic pain. But that's say also have, different people, right? Like for, for instance, when I smoke weed, it puts me in chronic pain. Yeah, right. And so like with some people, it has been found, if you like look at a white paper and, and read it the way you want to read it, you can see that marijuana has uh, has helped some people with chronic pain. And so immediately the argument uh, turns into, uh, well, why aren't we helping? Why aren't we letting these people with chronic pain treat their chronic pain? It's cruel to do that when that's really a junk argument because, you know, something like, like I said, like a cortisone shot is a really safe way of dealing with chronic pain that doesn't give you nearly as many side effects and the average person dealing with chronic pain doesn't want to be stoned they don't want to have the side effects of marijuana which is getting high because they want to pick up their kids from school you know they want to do things and so i i just feel like or same with sleep like marijuana helps you sleep well you know what ambien and lunesta help you sleep way better and um you don't have to smoke them like so all of these things can just, I, I just feel like I'm, I'm such a fan of legalizing all drugs. I, f I honestly feel that if we just stuck with like this narrative of it being a human rights issue and stopped arguing that like marijuana is better at dealing with chronic pain or dealing with whatever than the actual drugs that are made for that are, then we, we, it probably would have all been legal by now. But yeah, um, but with anxiety, do you not if think I'm that like daily use of Ambien is potentially worse for you than daily use of weed? Um, I think that, yeah. So, I mean, I, Ambien's a day. I think Lunesta is not physically addictive. I think Ambien is, if I'm to remember. I'm, I mean, I'm obviously not a pharmacist. I don't know. But uh, if you are taking Ambien, you're, you're not buying it from your friend. You're, you're getting it under a doctor's supervision. And if that doctor is doing their job, then they know not to be giving it to you every day unless it's a low dose and they're managing an addiction that 
they can then taper you off of safely, either with that or with, you know, a supplemental prescription. Um, so I'm trying to think what it is, well, which one I read. It, it's There's a British um, study on anxiety um, on, like, sh- basically, can cannabis help anxiety? And it was a double-blind study on, like, 10 patients, and that's the only time this has ever been been studied. Um, and with most mental health issues, exactly like you said, those studies show that it does improve anxiety with some people and it makes it worse with others. And there's this there. So the end result is just null. And yeah, right. also 10 and, people is not a lot. Yeah. Like that was the only true anxiety test. And it's just sort of like really 10 people. Um, so anyway, I, I think my overall point is like a, as much as I, I think that people should be able to do whatever they want, uh, I, I get really angry um, or, I, or I guess I, I just find it incredibly entitled because this is something that's happened my entire life is I've told somebody that I take the drugs that I take, you know, that I take these prescription drugs and they told me that I got to stop taking that shit. I need to smoke weed. And and that is like, man, like like I think a lot of people that listen to your podcast are probably – Probably, you know, yeah, I'm sure a lot of pot smokers listen to your podcast, and I'm sure that there are people who listen to your podcast just because I, you know, I know, you know, the, the sort of music scene and the people that listen to our types of music, my music included. I'm sure a lot of people that listen that will listen to this have said that to somebody before. <laughs> have said like, you need to not be taking antidepressants; that stuff will kill you. You need to be smoking pot. Yeah, I saw a pretty classic meme once. It was like a David and Goliath meme where there was like a small character and then this huge giant with like a bat. And the <laughs> the small person was like, uh, weed gives me anxiety or whatever. And then like the big guy with the bat on the bat was written, you just haven't tried the right strain yet or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what people um, always say. They're like, oh, what about sativa? Or maybe you just don't like, in- maybe you're more of an indica smoker or a high, you know. Right. I've, I've tried both. They're just giving me different forms of anxiety. Sativa is like aggressive anxiety and indica is like, I'm going to die anxiety. <laughs> Yeah, and and it it sounds like we're it probably sounds like we're talking shit about pot. We're not. No, no, all. definitely not. I'm pro legalization. Yeah. I, I I agree that for some people it's super beneficial. My ex girlfriend, yeah. it was amazing for her. I could tell like when she didn't smoke it, she was having a way harder time than when she did. Right. Um, and for me, at times in my life when I was younger, especially, it was uh, great for me. Like for, from the ages of like I don't know, seventeen to twenty, it was amazing. Uh, helped me through a lot of anxiety at that age but then it started to have sort of the the reverse effect over time i guess my theory is that i i was smoking a shitload of weed too like i was smoking like seven grams a day or something (laughs) so my theory is that i just burnt some receptor out or something (laughs) yeah your gaba receptors that's your fear center yeah um so yeah i i think like my overall point is like if before you say that to someone, if if you're ever if you're against SSRIs for whatever reason, or if you're against you know big pharma, try to think about the route that they took before they saw the psychiatrist for the first time and got that prescription, because that route's really hard. Because it's not easy to even get a psychiatrist appointment in many states. It's difficult to do. It's expensive. Your health insurance is shitty about it. Like there's, if you have health insurance, if you don't, then like good luck, and. And then you have to go there and you have, you have to admit that you are mentally ill. And then you have to take a drug that verifies that you're mentally ill. And that's so hard to do. Like, that's so hard to do for a first time. And there's so many people that never get to that step that end up killing themselves. Or they end up, you know, sh- shooting up a school. Or they end, you know, like it's... it's or they get uh, addicted to heroin or something like that. Right, yeah. I mean, it's... Yeah, and so that that's always been a pet peeve of mine is is the yeah is that sort of <laughs> yeah I, I'd yeah, agree, man. man. And I I just had that experience basically because this is my first like sort of brain drug that I've taken from from big pharma, right? Like I've up until this point self medicated with yeah. basically alcohol or other drugs throughout my life to kind of just mute my feelings a little bit, uh, and I was kind of aware like especially over the last few years i've been super self-aware that that's exactly what i'm doing but i kind of had in the back of my mind that this will probably just go away and it's maybe just a phase and as i get older maybe the drugs will just like 
exit my life and alcoholism will exit my life and I'll become like a more wholesome person or whatever. But really the opposite was true. It was like as I was getting older, the drug addictions and the alcoholism were just getting worse and worse and worse each year, right? Like I was finding ways to um, to curb them. For instance, what I would do is the first three months of the year I wouldn't drink and then I would do sober October, dry July. Like I would build in dry months of the year and shit just sure. purely for sustainability so I didn't fucking kill myself basically. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, the route that I would have kept going I think is just continuing to to do that. But it's it seems a lot more sustainable to be taking something like Wellbutrin or, you know, Sure. And, and you also, if it doesn't work, you have somebody with, you know, 12 years of education and then many years beyond that of experience to advise you on what to do, who, by the way, if they advise you wrong, you can sue them. So, you know, it's like they have liability as well. So it's, it's pretty, it's much better than making those decisions for yourself or having a, uh, you know, a guy named Carl who sells you a bag, um, do it or recommend you what to take next. Uh, so another interesting thing that you kind of touched on um, is how touring and being an artist enables uh, drug use and enables... Uh, well, it's just really that. normalized, right? Like mm -hmm. you can you can be in a, a green room and let's just use alcohol for an example, right? It's just super normal for the promoter or whatever or the venue manager or just anyone there to be like, oh, you want me to fill this beer with alcohol? And you're oh, like, yeah. sure, yeah. Sure, <laughs> and they just yeah. fill it with anything you want. And then you're like, yeah, I like, all right. I don't have any alcohol. I've never had any alcohol in my rider. And, you know, I'll go backstage and there's cases of, of beer and there's hard liquor a lot of times and there's, yeah, I'm just like, well, I didn't answer this. I'll leave it for the next band, I guess. Um, <clears throat> right. Not that and I'm then, against drinking, but I just would not drink that much before performing anyway. But Right. But um, the, the whole touring experience, even not at the show, it's like, well, what are you doing before the show? You're at dinner, probably have a beer at dinner or something like that. Uh, or you're on an airplane where there's, you know, a lot of yeah the, the people are coming through with the carts and they're just like, would you like anything? And you're like, yeah, sure. I'll get a another beer here or like so it right. ends up like uh, for me anyway this may not be the case for a lot this probably isn't the case for a lot of djs or touring musicians but for me it was because i was fucking alcoholic um yeah it was just like constant drinking through the whole experience basically and then when i'd get home to the studio i was like oh i'll just drink and make tunes you know so it was just yeah alcohol for me was really bad yeah, that's, yeah, th I mean, that that's a thing. And there, it, it definitely is a thing. It's been a thing throughout. So, I mean, here's here's a good, like, example of, I, I had done some tours in between when I was fighting. I had done some tours in between training camps. And training, not only do you not want to be drinking or smoking or doing anything like that when you're preparing for an MMA or a boxing fight, uh, for obvious reasons, but you're you're also getting drug tested because you're part of a, athletic commission and if you pop for marijuana you're out you're done and uh you'll essentially it's it's pretty bad you may get kicked out of your training camp you may get you know you may be kicked out of your gym as a result of it because it's really disrespectful to waste of everybody's time to be you know secretly smoking pot when you know a bunch of people are spending time believing in you right so i would i would do some shows you know so i could make a living you know do, I would do some shows and I would always just be so angry because I would get done with the show and I'd go backstage and there'd be a bunch of people like hot boxing the green room and I'd be headlining the show and I'd just be like, I can't breathe this in. Like I'll literally test positive when I go home next week, I'm going to test positive for marijuana use. And, and it was just every single show, like I would end up being hot boxed somewhere in the bathroom, in the green room, you know, and somewhere like some, some way I was unable to avoid, uh, you know, a cloud of, of dope smoke in my face. Um, and again, you know, I don't even mind the smell, but it was just like, I can't have this in my system. Otherwise, you know, I'll end up be, being penalized. Uh, but another interesting thing that like, aside from drugs and alcohol being constantly available, I think another interesting thing uh, is like, how do you prepare yourself? Like, I guess I'm going to go back to like 2009 or something. Um, I lived on the south side of Chicago, well, I guess like 2010. I lived on the south side of Chicago. Um, I would go on tour 
Uh, I would, you know, have some, some of my shows would be bigger than others, but generally at many of the shows you play people, everybody who's there is paying money to see you. Like that's the reason they're out tonight. They're paying money to see you perform. And if they get to meet you, they're very typically, you know, obviously some people aren't, but they're typically very respectful. They want to know about you. They're asking you questions about things that you wrote, songs that you wrote or shows that you played or things that you said previously or how you do what you do. And and you immediately have the respect of pretty much everybody. And then when you go home, I, you know, I would go back to Chicago and I would go home and I would, you know, go to a bar for a friend's birthday or something. And immediately I was just another random face, which I am and I should be right. You know, I don't deserve I don't believe that I deserve special treatment, but I think floating between those two worlds actually was really hard. That's hard to cope with. Like, that's kind of insane to just be the most important person for a month and then be the average person that most people ignore for a month. Um, And another interesting place where that, (laughs) where like, I guess we're going to like talk, in addition to mental health stuff, talking about like controversial things. Another place where I'm sure that that is poking its ugly head out is with things like the base nectar situation. Like, no, I'm not, you know, would not defend him in a million years, but. Did you hear the podcast I just did with uh, Mimi Page and Ill Gaze? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I I heard it. Um, Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a good, it was a good podcast and it was definitely, I mean, I'm not that familiar with base nectar. Um. I've met him once. Uh, I don't, I mean, just to be completely honest, I would have said this a month ago or two months ago, whenever the hell this happened. Um, I don't really care about, I care about his victims. You know, I care about that. The fact that like the genre that I'm involved with um, keeps having this problem with, you know, people pseudo or fully sexually assaulting their fans. I don't like being lumped into that workforce but at the same time like personally i i don't care about it like i you know I've, I've never had a relationship with him in any way um and i've never really listened to his music and and probably vice versa but you do wonder like he has or had a cult essentially like he had a following that stemmed far beyond music that stemmed into like a way of life. It was like a Grateful Dead type thing where you had deadheads, but you had bass nectar people who followed him around and went to every show. And it seemed like his life was pretty much his musical moniker. He didn't like, you know, it seems like he was pretty much surrounded by those people at all times. And you start to wonder where, where his feet left the ground, you know, like where he where he lost touch with what is appropriate and what's not appropriate. And he obviously knows, you know, what is appropriate and not appropriate, but like, I believe that it gets easier to justify these things. Like once. it becomes more normalized over your career or something. Yeah. And, and this sort of goes back, like there's somebody who, uh, through a festival, um, in the Northwest who, I had heard a lot of stories from people who were unrelated about, him giving giving MDMA or giving drugs to girls, young girls, like 18, 19, and they would get really messed up and then they would crash in his tent with him. And he was one of the promoters of this festival. And I cut off, I cut all ties with this guy. And, um, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't publicly say anything because that's, I'll leave that for his victims to do, you know, like if, if his victims want to come forward, they, they should, if not, then. They shouldn't, you know, that's not for me to decide. But um, but it really made me think, like, I, I, I actually knew that guy pretty well, and he was a great resource to have as an artist. You know, he booked me a lot. And I really think that in his head, he didn't see himself as, like, the dude waiting in the dark alley. He saw himself as, like, hanging out with some chicks. And, and you know, I, I feel like just being the promoter of a festival even. He wasn't even an artist, but being a promoter of a festival even, he had so much respect from so many people and he kind of had this elevated way that he was being treated that he kind of lost perspective. Um, and it, and I think it enabled him to justify some really shitty things. It's, 
I feel like me saying this is already going to get a, a bunch of criticism, but I understand that I try and look at things like this without judgment initially. Like I have my own judgments and I, I could say, I could call these people names in, until I turn blue. But I think that's interesting to look at these things without judgment because that's how you don't, that's how you don't keep repeating these situations. I think, I think that if you can learn from, from, if you could take something away from this, that, that could actually prevent it in the future, that would be positive. That would be a positive thing. Like if you could actually have some sort of <laughs> more, more known coping mechanism for artists to deal with a constant flow of drugs and alcohol. And I guess in some cases, women, young ladies, but. Right. Yeah. So, um, one thing that I'm subjecting my entire team to, uh, before moving forward at all with more tours, I mean, obviously we can't move forward with tours now anyway, and moving forward just in general, um, is I'm having my entire team go to a workshop put together by this company called good night out Vancouver, which okay. is all run by women. And basically it's a workshop, uh, that they, uh, pretty much willingly giving away for free to musicians and artists and, uh, management teams and agencies and just like people in the music industry. Um, and it's just a, a whole, uh, talk that they give or a presentation that they give over originally it was in person i think now it's just on zoom and stuff like that or uh you know it's virtual but it's just about like rape culture and power dynamics and all of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and just things that you can employ at your shows uh to to sort of lessen the risk of all of this kind of stuff so that's the route i'm personally taking um and you know other people have taken this route already like g jones for instance who is actually a collaborator of bass nectar Okay. started doing this a, a year ago and one of the things they do is like everyone that comes into your show they give a card and that card just you know has some simple rules on it uh hmm. yeah and then all of the security are given like an extra set of training at the start of the evening just to like make them extra aware to look out for that kind of stuff yeah um, and so on and so forth so i think that's a good start right to like right you know try and remove this problem is there a lot of pushback on that like do you do you see from, a lot of from people my team i mean my team no is... not from your team no i mean but I, I just mean from like your fans like getting the card i mean i because i'm i'm sure the word snowflake is thrown around once somebody discovered when a lot of people discover that well i guess i don't know i mean our demographics are pretty i, I think maybe politically my demographic the people who would show up to my show spans out a little bit more like I feel like you probably have a, a little bit of a younger audience. I, I some of my fans are conservatives. No, I don't. Have, I don't know if I have any like MAGA fans, but I, <laughs> I definitely have like some like older you, uh, conserv fiscally conservative fans. So I think about that sometimes, and I think like I'm. I have a lot of fans, right? Like it's, I don't know, somewhere in the range of if it's hard to count like social media numbers because a lot of those people are probably not like really fans. Right. So if yeah. you count like real fans who like actually know a bit about me, have bought an album or come to a show or something like that, it's probably yeah. in the range of, I don't know, 5,000 people, maybe 10,000 people. Okay. Yeah. Like a reasonable number of people. Surely one of them has to be a Donald Trump supporter. Right. Yeah. Right. Like just, yeah. just by probability. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I do, it, there are, I guess I, now that I think about it on social media, every now and then I've been sort of called out for saying an anti-Trump thing by, by a name that I recognize, that I've recognized for a while. And I've been like, oh, wow, you've kept your mouth shut this entire time. You've just been like <laughs> listening to me, like slamming your belief system. <clears throat> um, but at the same time, it, this is like one of those terribly you know this is one of those like dividing moments where where you can actually say or i guess at me at, at some point where i'm actually like yeah if 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 you can support what this administration is doing and has done and if you could support you know somebody who's talking about like not conceding to an election loss and stuff like that then like I don't really care if I lose you as a fan, which is terrible because right. I've always put fans first with everything. But it's it's one of those things where it's div dividing to the point where it's like if. Yeah, it's like if it, you stand it, for these things, kind of get, get the fuck out. 
Right. Yeah, pretty much. Like you just draw that line because it's like there's. Yeah, I mean, it. But well, I, I guess it makes sense, too. I mean, even from like a business point of view, because it, it's just like because it has to do with xenophobia and racism as well. And it's like I, I, I don't tolerate that. I've. I, I weirdly, I've probably taken more flack in my career in terms of like political beliefs and things. I, I've probably taken more flack just because of me being annoyed with how male centric synths are, like the synth world. Like I've always been annoyed by that. Um, yeah, like the and I've website sort of, Muff Wiggler or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and that that came about when I I ran a I ran a nonprofit music school in Chicago, and a twelve year old girl was asking me about like how synthesizers like what kind of synthesizers to get if she wanted to get one and this and that and i literally the first thing i thought in my head was like oh you should go ask on muffwig or and i was like well, i can't fucking say that to a 12 year old girl like this is and then i'm just like oh well then go to gear sluts no wait no sorry well those are the only two you got so yeah mm. uh, did you hear about joe biden's marketing campaign today he uh no. it was they so the Joe Biden campaign invested into ads, just Facebook and Instagram ads. It was either two hundred and eighty million or two hundred and eighty mm-hmm. billion dollars today. I would say million. Yeah. Okay, million. So that's more than Trump's administration has spent on marketing since twenty seventeen combined up until wow. now. Wow, that's crazy. It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like I feel like Biden's entire campaign is just not being trump yeah which pretty much <laughs> it's yeah well it's like from my wife i've 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 followed the the british election pretty closely and it was really i mean I'm, i i know not to like speak out of my element too much because I, I clearly don't have nearly as much knowledge of british politics as i do american but yeah it really seemed like i guess i i guess it seems like joe biden's learning from mistakes that were made in england um lit the last election like he's just learning to just lay low and let the conservatives shoot themselves in the foot and just not be that person and just be the other guy and that's see i mean whatever that supposedly but looking at polls it's working really well from him but for him but looking at polls in 2016 was also really reassuring for hillary and it clearly didn't turn out that way so who knows yeah. Um, I want to like sort of rewind a bit and go back yeah. to mental health stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's easy to get back. I'm, everybody's talking about politics. Let's, let's go back to mental health. Right. Um, so I wrote a few things in an Evernote. Uh, one thing was like something we already touched on, which was, um, you know, people being like, Oh, you should smoke weed and that will fix your problem or whatever. I had actually that exact experience with alcoholism, but with, with a, t- it wasn't just one person. It was like a few people over my life. Well, not my lifetime, basically over the few years, it was like maybe 10 people total who told me I should start uh, taking mushrooms regularly oh, to, yeah. to fix alcoholism. And apparently there has been, I mean, I don't know. This is the thing, right? Everyone's like, oh, there's been studies on this shit. But it's like, I don't know. I haven't looked it up. I don't know if there has been. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I've less, I've done a lot of mushrooms and that didn't fix my alcoholism, right? Yeah. But I started taking naltrexin and I actually think that's the first thing that that has potentially maybe fixed it for me. Because the, so one, one thing I've, that happens to me, right, is when I start drinking, like I, if I can like, go a night and be like, all right, I'm not going to drink and just not drink anything. But if I start drinking, like if I have one beer, it's like, that's it. It's over. Like I'm drinking Mm -hmm. like 10 beers. Um, But with Naltrexin, I was able to drink just like two beers the other night. And then I was like, yeah, I don't want any more. So I think Mm. that's actually a a drug that could potentially fix it. So I guess my point is just that like big pharma kind of won in that (laughs) battle against mushrooms. Yeah, Naltrex, Naltrexin, um, doesn't it, uh, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with the drug as much as I am with like an SSRI or something, but I believe that it sort of mutes the reward center that people get when they're using heroin or alcohol or things like that. And so you just it's sort of mostly don't, for heroin. Yeah. Yeah. And so you don't really get put into that, uh, 
I guess, vicious cycle of like having to feed a reward center um, as much, you know, it sort of like dulls it a little bit, um, which, which is interesting. Speaking of mushrooms and alcohol, um, a quick side note, there is a, I believe they're called white caps and it's a mushroom where if you eat it, uh, it has no effects. It tastes pretty decent if you cook it. Um, however, if you drink within like a couple days of eating it, you get violently ill. Like you puke your guts out. And it's huh. just like an interesting, that is an actual like, I mean, it's not, it's a very not recommended to use just because like you don't want people puking their guts out ever. You know, that's not a healthy, healthy thing to do. But yeah, that is, I, I wonder if that's where people get like the psychedelic mushroom thing. If it's actually mm-hmm. from... Because that, that is, there is a fungus that does treat alcoholism in that way where it just makes you unable to digest it. But, you know, hmm. nobody's done that in 100 years. So, Right. Um, yeah, another old story, which could potentially be a wives' tale that I've heard about mushrooms, um, specifically the fly agaric amanita style of mushrooms, which is um, the red ones with the white spots, like mm-hmm. the classic Alice in Wonderland mushrooms. Uh, they're insanely toxic. Like if you just eat them... Uh, raw I'm pretty sure they'll make you like really sick so what kings used to do or just like royalty back in the day they would make their slaves eat them and then they would collect their piss and then drink their slaves piss and (sighs) apparently like the slaves would like filter it but their piss would then be this really nice psychedelic that that wouldn't make you sick oh geez that's nice kings are great i have no idea if that's true or not but i like to imagine kings (laughs) drinking piss as if it's like some delicacy or whatever yeah (laughs) yeah jokes on you idiot yeah (laughs) yeah that's um yeah yeah that that, i mean and it sounds like what you're describing it sounds like it's a i mean that that's sounds pretty classical alcoholism like chemically right Mm. is like being able to go a night without, I mean, obviously like severe alcoholism, like you have withdrawals if you don't have it for a day, but, um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like that's cause for example, I can have like these days lately, um, like I pretty much almost every night I have a glass of bourbon, a glass of straight bourbon and it's a small glass. I poured the same amount. I'm never over pouring. I'm never, I never have two cause I always have to like get to work after, after my, you know, drink time. And, uh, yeah, and I just sort of keep it that way. Um, but so, what is I, the I, what is the benefit to you from having one bourbon? Like, what 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 do you get out of that that makes it worth you having it? Um, I mean, I do feel I, it does relax me a bit. You know, I feel like it's and and I just like bourbon. I like sipping on bourbon. It's a I don't know, like the the taste and just the activity of doing it. Yeah, it's it's a nice. Uh, I mean, I guess you have to get used to it, but like, especially straight bourbon, it's like 50% alcohol, but, um, so I never like, yeah, I never understood people that could have like one beer, right? Cause whenever I have one beer, I mean, my alcoholic brain is just like, oh yeah, a little tiny buzz, but I'm like, right. you know, it would be sicker two beers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then I have yeah. like another one right. and then I'm like, oh, you know, clearly like if you just keep having these, it'll go up and up and up. And then, you know, you get to some point where there's obviously diminishing returns. And then Mm -hmm. because I have whatever genetics to make me predisposed to alcoholism, when ethanol level, when the ethanol level in my blood starts to drop, I start to feel massively depressed, which makes me want to drink more and so on and so forth. And apparently some people have this gene, which I'm pretty damn sure I have. It's like pretty common and it's, it's a predisposition thing to that a lot of alcoholics have that, you know, some people have it, some people don't, that when the ethanol in your blood starts dropping, it can make you feel extremely down and hmm. that causes you to want to have another drink to up the ethanol level again. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's, it's interesting because like when I did drink more, I, um, yeah, like I, I, there was a point and I didn't reach it every time I drank, but there's a point and it was low. I've always been a lightweight and there, there's like a point where I'm feeling great and I'm just way more social and I have way more confidence and I'm always, and I'm having more fun. And then the moment I get past that point, I just want to go home. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to be around anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. I get, I'm just depressed and 
sad and tired and I don't want to be around. And, you know, I, I don't like cry at the party, but I will. That's when I call a cab and say, ah, I don't feel good. I'm going home. And, you know, that's that's interesting because that it's it was always interesting to try and like reach that point and then cut myself off after that when I was younger, when I would like go out drinking, you know, or something, um, which I didn't really know. I guess I suppose I never really did that much of, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, your listeners can't see this, but uh, y- you look healthier. I, I mean, I suppose that you've been, I don't know if that's from a diet or not uh, drinking as much, or if you've been hitting the covid gym or you know what, what you're <laughs> not uh, sure that what you're is doing. uh that is from drug use and not eating okay yeah i dropped well, then I mean, 30 pounds from literally just wow. not eating from just not eating due to drug use or not eating due to like losing weight no or you know I, or not eating for dietary reasons just loss of appetite because i was doing drugs wow yeah um, but, uh, I've started eating again, which is good. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Likewise, you've, you've been on the Soylent diet, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I've like leveled out for a while now. I've, I think I reached my goal and like, man, time in the pandemic. It's so weird. I think I reached it in May or something. And now I've just been like hovering around my, the weight I like being at. I really, really want to go to the gym and really want to do do some like boxing and stuff because this is like the weight where I really love working out, but obviously I'm not going to do that. Yeah. What have uh, you been doing fitness wise during COVID? I've, I've kind of interested as because I, I have some like weights and stuff and I've been, I should really like get some sort of just weighted routine that I can do around the house, like maybe squats and rows and shoulder press and you know just shit you can do with like 25 pound dumbbells maybe some like kettlebell swing type things and push-ups and calisthenics and shit like i i should really do that i I did some yoga yesterday actually but yeah i'm curious what, what have you been doing i've almost bought a rowing machine like five times um you like rowing those, machines yeah the i mean they're fine i guess but they're they're just really low impact and they're full body workout and I can do it indefinitely which is nice like it's just one of those workouts that I could just keep going and going and going and I never get tired um but uh other than that I like don't really have that much workout stuff here I have you know like an ab roller and some things like that um my wife took like we have this extra room and she put pads mats all on the ground and it's like she works out in there and does like uh it's funny because I put like the Oculus up there and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll do some like VR stuff because there's a lot of like really good workout programs with VR now and that seems way more exciting than, you know, watching a YouTube workout video or something. And uh, and she also does jujitsu, which I do, but, you know, she also weighs like half of what I weigh. So, <laughs> yeah, you, guys can't and, really you know, and I'm, yeah, and she's like a white belt and I'm a purple belt. So it's probably not going to be that much, wouldn't be that much fun to be like doing that all the time. Uh but yeah, so I, I, I walk a lot. I hike a lot. Um, it's really hot here. I, I feel like I have enough yard work to where I'm usually getting, uh, decent, but I'm definitely not getting as much of a workout as I would like. And I, I think I'm going to try something with VR. Like I'm going to try one of those fitness games. Uh, the boxing game's brutal in VR. Um, there's one that I, there's like a really good boxing game that, uh, is actually like, makes my shoulders sore and stuff. And I, you know, I go fully in on that. Um, you know, what's really funny is I, I'm allergic to bees and wasps and whatnot. And my allergy has been kind of odd. Like I had been stung quite a few times and sometimes I'll have like a very slight reaction where I just feel like my adrenaline and I get swollen. And then other times it'll be like really bad. And the yeah, other that's day what I was made clean- your, uh, That's what made your eyebrow go white, right? No. <laughs> Oh. I don't know. <laughs> it's a rumor. I've, okay, right. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah okay. I may have said that on Reddit to somebody or something, but uh, no, it's a scar from boxing. Like I, I just got punched and it grew back white. Um, so I, uh, but the other day, um, two days ago now, I was uh, cleaning out the gutters in, in the front of the house and uh, there's just this wasp nest up there and just one wasp just stung me in the face and the neck. And I like immediately just started going into like convulsions and, Whoa. and it was like, yeah, and my like wife had no idea what to do. Like she was like 
what do I do? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> like, go like get a first aid uh, kit and we'll just like... like seizing? Like, yeah, like all my muscles awesome. were clenched. That, that's why I'm like relating it to working out because I was like, that's like the best workout I've ever had in my life. Like I just had all of my muscles cramped at once for 30 minutes and it was like Damn. excruciating. But like, I feel like I went to the gym for like 24 hours straight. Like I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> then, but yeah, <laughs> like now I am now. I just feel like I had a really good workout, but at the time it was of course terrifying, but yeah, Damn. fucking wasps. Yeah. So, uh. I called this pest control guy and I was like, man, this is going to be so expensive. And this, so this guy wanted 80 bucks and he just like walked up on my roof and started batting away wasp nests that he would find. <laughs> he's like, oh, you got one here. He's like, you guys have too much. He's like, you guys have too much of a garden, man. This is paradise for fucking wasps. They love this shit. You have too many flowers. And he was literally going up there and he was getting stung. He, he got stung so much that he went and put on a hoodie and then, like, went back up with his hoodie on and was just, like, batting him away. And this guy's face was, like, a battlefield. Like, it, like, literally, just see every single little, like, sting and bite that he's had on his face. And and it was so interesting because I was just like, man, this is the worst job ever. I was just watching him from inside, like, watching him, like, climb up and down the roof. I was like, this is the worst job ever, but at the same time, he's my hero. Yeah, you'd think he'd just have, like, some protective equipment, right? Like a... Yeah, like fuck mask that. Of some sort, and maybe some gloves, and like you know, at least a full like, body enclosure. Like I have this really steep roof, and I have I've bought three different ladders just to try and like clean out my gutters and do things on the side of the house I need to do, and I'm I'm still like terrified to do it, and because my roof's like just too steep to walk on, and if I hire somebody to do like gutter cleaning, they won't walk up on the roof, and this dude just got out this janky little ladder from his truck and like walked up the roof and just walked around it like a mountain goat. I'm just like. <laughs> This dude's my hero. Like, like just <laughs> like and I told him, I'm like, I'm gonna hire you for literally like everything ever. Like you're the most fearless person. And I wrote him a review too on like Thumbtack. <laughs> and I, I said I said that he's like the John Wick of Hornets. Or John <laughs> Like he's literally I like I felt like I called John Wick to like deal with a problem and he just went up there and just Amazing. Yeah, but now it's safe. Dude, being a homeowner is sick. Um, I just yeah, you got a house. That's amazing. I did. Yeah, my girlfriend and I bought a house. Um, yesterday, I took a door off and uh, took all the hinges off and shit, and like turned it around and just mounted it the other way so it would open the opposite way. And I was like, "This is fucking awesome! I can just take doors off and turn them around if I want." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "This is like not a thing I've ever been allowed to do in other houses." Freedom, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unbridled freedom. Yeah. Uh, well, it's funny. I've, I was just saying, I was just saying to my wife that like every now and then, like, cause the other day it was like, basically our gutters were filled with stuff and then the water was pooling up on the roof when we would have like these massive torrential thunderstorms that you get down here in the South. And, uh, you would just have like these trop subtropical storms that would happen where it just rain like pisses for like 15 minutes and then gets sunny again. And, uh, it started leaking in through a window because it was like pooling up above the window and the thing. And so I'm like, okay, so we need to deal with that. We may have to deal with water damage. Then while cleaning that gutter out, now we have hornets or now we have wasps and, and I'm getting stung and now I can't even do that. So now I have to call somebody to do all these things and I'm like adding all these things up. Then when the pest control guy came, he notified me that I have bats living in a, in the top of my attic and yeah, which bats? which I was kind of like cool, nice, but at the same time, uh, you're not allowed to kill them because they're a protected species. So he can't just like spray for bats and get rid of them. You have to like put this thing called an excluder on the end of the vent, and that basically they can fly out of, but they can't fly in. And it's funny because the night after that, I walked up, I like walked out in front and looked up, and there were just bats everywhere. And I was like, oh wow, I do have bats. I have a lot of bats. <laughs> just bats flying around eating insects and stuff but anyway Damn. yeah i was saying i was saying to my wife i was just like yeah sometimes renting's better i think you know because this would be a landlord all of these things would just be like me being angry at a landlord and me threatening to like call the the county if he doesn't deal with it and yeah but I now mean, i have to deal with it all i don't know like I've, yeah. i maybe had a sh just a series of bad experiences but since living in america i've lived in or five different houses maybe mm -hmm. and none of them i've had a landlord where asking them for anything has resulted in that thing 
You know, like for instance, I had one house where like none of the windows would open, literally none. And I was yeah. like, I would like to open some of my windows so I can like air out my house. And they were like, uh, yeah, we'll we'll replace the windows at some point. And I was like, cool. Can that point be like while I'm living here so I can yeah. open them? Yeah. And uh, it didn't didn't happen. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've just had a shit run of landlords, to be honest. They're, they're all shit. Um, and I could see it from both. I, I've been a building manager before in Chicago. Um, like I basically subleased a massive building. And so I had like the coach house in the back where my studio was. And then I rented out all the units in the front and it was like keeping up on rent. You'd be really surprised to know how few people pay rent on time and you know, how few people and what people do to houses when they rent them and what they do to apartments when they rent them, they absolutely destroy them. And, And so on that side, I definitely can understand like just watching your investment get destroyed over and over again is not easy. But on the other end, yeah, every landlord I've had, I've noticed that if I have landlords where I know the landlord personally, like not, not as if, not as if like the person's my friend, but where I can call that person's cell phone. And I feel like that's a better thing. Cause you could actually form this sort of, you could negotiate something, right. Whereas a property manager, they're just like, they're just trained to professionally make you wait until you stop complaining like that's what their job is and so and you don't really know who owns the building and you don't know you know it's what there's just more potential for abuse but yeah being a homeowner is amazing it's like that's my number one advice to literally everybody it's like buy buy real estate right if you can yeah, you know the way you put it to me was clever i think it's like you just buy a thing that you can live in that is way cheaper than renting a thing. And then when you sell the thing, it's worth a little bit more. It's like just a good accruing investment. Yeah. And the biggest, the biggest argument on that is even if you're not paying attention to real estate markets, you're buying something that doesn't, that is immune to inflation. Like shelter is immune to inflation. Land is immune to inflation. God's not making any more of it, as they say. Um, like, yeah, we're never going to have any more land. There's always, it's just going to become a bigger shortage as population grows. And so, but yeah, when you, when you think about inflation, it's kind of insane. The amount of money that the average person, if they have a savings, that's just sitting in a savings account or that's just sitting in PayPal or something. It's like, you're, you're losing on a year like this, you're going to be losing like, I don't know. I wonder what inflation is going to be like this year. 5% maybe something crazy, like enough to like really suck for a person who's saving for a retirement or something right yeah it is insane right like um for instance when i uh went to buy this house well actually my my girlfriend bought the house and i sent her money to do it and whatever yeah um but what i did is i put like a large sum of money in a goldman sachs account it's just it was just like sitting there for a minute just in between escrow and shit like that and uh yeah, it was crazy, man. Just having it in a Goldman Sachs account for like, uh, I don't know, two weeks or something like that. It, uh, the interest was like fifty bucks or something on a on a large amount yeah. of money like that. It's like if I had left it sitting there for a year, it would have been like a, I don't know, probably would have made like a thousand bucks just sitting oh, in yeah. the account, and like not doing anything. And I was like, fuck, right. I've had this money sitting in like PayPal for a long ass time. What an idiot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have family members who have like their entire retirement, say like their we, entire life savings in like checking accounts. And you're we just we like, should <laughs> talk about this because this is a thing that I don't think a lot of people understand. And I didn't understand it until probably earlier this month or <laughs> you know, earlier yeah. this year, at least. Like I only really started learning about this stuff after moving to San Francisco. Well, I know I've been like preaching at you about it a lot. Like I, I, maybe I know that I'm like one of the one of the people's probably I've been probably annoying about it. Like, yeah. I so think. the bottom line is that money is constantly worth less. So if your money is just sitting there at the same value that it always is, like it does in a checking account. And in fact, you, I think pay to have a checking account, like 20 bucks yeah. a month or something. Um, yeah, it depends, but yeah. Yeah. It's just effectively that like, let's say you have 500 bucks sitting in a checking account, that 500 bucks, is worth less than 500 bucks every year right yeah that's the concept and therefore you want to put it in a high interest account so it at least makes back the amount that it's lost each year so it's 
so it's not like you're losing money at least it's like your money is still retaining its value at least yeah yeah so a house basically is like a great way to to uh, defend yourself against inflation yeah uh property property is almost always a good way of doing that you know and obviously in terms of how to buy a house my dog's so vocal. Um, the, in terms of like how to buy a house, there's there's a whole lot of advice, and obviously having like a good real estate agent is a good, a good, you know, start to that. Um, but overall, yeah, like having if you have any sort of savings, it, it also a, a thing that a lot of people don't realize about money, um, and and something I didn't realize for a really long time. The first time I got like a decent sum of money handed to me, um, I like bought shoes. And gave the rest to charity. Like, it was just... And I don't ever want to say it's dumb to give money away to charity, but I was, like, in my late 20s, and I shouldn't have. You know, I should have probably put money down on a house. I would have had a lot more later on to give to charity. Um, But, yeah, there's kind of a weird disconnect with the way that people think about money. And, And I see that a lot when people... When you see those, like, memes about, like, how much Jeff Bezos is worth. And, like, you know, you could give every American $500,000 and Jeff Bezos would still be a billionaire, you know, whatever those things are, where they like compare his worth, they compare his net worth to something that isn't net worth, as if net worth is actually like... He's so insanely rich though. Like, didn't he go through a divorce with his wife and he lost half of his money to her and it made her the second richest person in the world and him the first richest person in the world? I don't think I, I don't know. I I, tr- I truly don't know. But both of these things are like net worth, right? So it's like what would happen to Amazon stock if Jeff Bezos just liquidated everything? Like cuz he can't spend it, right? He can't spend his worth. Like but it, he, like his liquid assets are enough to have whatever he wants within reason. Like he probably can't have 500 777 jets you know <laughs> it's like yeah, he, that's he probably could, worth more than the global gdp but yeah, he, um he could maybe buy australia yeah i wonder yeah um but but yeah and then also like the thing with like amazon not paying taxes which like yeah i think amazon should pay taxes too like i think everybody kind of agrees with that but uh people d- don't really understand why they don't pay taxes they think it's like because of some shady dealings or loophole but it's just because amazon reinvests in itself and and they do so in a way where they take like i mean they started that whole drone division of like you know where they have where they tested and built and tested drones delivering packages to people and then they just scrapped it because it didn't work out in the end and that's a loss and that's something they wrote off that's probably you know who knows how many millions of dollars they put into that or um, you know, every little fire tablet that they made that didn't sell good and every single little thing that they've like tried to put their hands into or tried to put their fingers into um, to expand and it didn't work. And they just reinvest in themselves. It's like, what? Well, that's how the company works. And that's why it took them so long to make a profit. It took, the, it took them like an absurdly long time to actually make a profit. And so for that reason, they don't really pay taxes because on paper, they don't really have that much profit. So we would need to like change tax law um, which has pros and cons because you you want to encourage companies to grow because that's how they hire so many people. That's how Amazon keeps hiring more and more people, and that's why right. Yeah, they create a they pay of jobs and it's good for the yeah, company. and and they do pay people. I mean, from what I see, I don't really know. I don't know anybody who works for Amazon, but from the job listings I see, um, they're like the delivery people. They actually pretty much help you start your own business as a contractor that works with Amazon, and you can actually get pretty well off financially just running your own Amazon delivery business in an Amazon truck. And so it's kind of like, it's such a weird, I mean, it's a gray area, like everything. Like it, I can't be against it, but I can't be for it. It was really weird to see. I remember like in early in the Democratic campaign, uh, I know Bernie, I, I think there's some other candidates that were just like, we need to break up Amazon and we need to stop Amazon from doing what it's doing. And because we need small businesses to flourish. And I just thought to myself, like, small businesses would be fucked in 2020 without Amazon. Like, when you think about the amount that need Amazon to do their fulfillment for cheap and, you know, that use it as a marketplace, like, 
like you'd you'd absolutely you know which is sad. you could say that's sad you know it's sad that we need Amazon to keep small businesses in, but at the same time it's like yeah just setting the whole thing on fire could actually be really bad. Um, Man, I think the board. Oh no, go on. So yeah, um, but I, I think more what I was getting at with like that sort of misunderstanding of the economy and with money is that the velocity of money is more important than the value like money is worthless when it's steadfast like if money is just in a bank account it's worthless anyway in inflation or not because it's not being spent on anything um and it's kind of funny i actually just that this is the best example i could think or the best example i know of um the velocity of money this is how it works in a very small economy a farmer and a mechanic with just 50 dollars between them buy goods and services from each other in just three transactions over the course of a year farmer spends 50 dollars on a tractor repair from the mechanic mechanic buys 40 dollars of corn from the farmer mechanic spends 10 dollars on barn cats from the farmer then 100 dollars changed hands in the course of a year even though there's only 50 dollars in this little economy so that's like that's a good way of looking at economics in the bigger picture and when you see like the market slowing of understanding how that's actually bad um when you see people buying less it's because the velocity of money's i guess going lower and so therefore it's worth less right because you want the more people spend and earn the better off everybody is it's very weird (laughs) but like it's it's weird when you when you like think of it all in one sentence like that but I wish I knew this stuff when I was younger, and I more importantly, I wish they taught this stuff in high school. Like I, I wish there was like a personal economics course in high school or something where you could literally be. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, because I'm sure a lot of kids would listen if you could. If you were like, "Look, do you want to be a millionaire when you're 30? Here's your life hack, and and <laughs> it's actually a real thing that works." You know, it's but I guess that's what we have TikTok for. Yeah, I want, I want to talk about um, something you said. I think you said it in like a YouTube video of yours when you were talking about using machine learning to write music, uh, using AI to write music or whatever. Yeah. You, you said you used machine learning to find a house that wouldn't decrease in value in your area or something like that. How did that work? Yeah, um, I pumped in... I basically got access to a big MLS, um, not Major League Soccer, but MLS is the real estate listing data. Um, I basically got access to a database of the MLS listings in Georgia, um, in the counties surrounding Atlanta, and uh, essentially crammed, studied all that data, and then just ran a prediction model based on that. And... weirdly so without like looking at any zoning or without looking at any sort of without even really looking at a map i was able to identify hot spots and where i bought a house is in a hot spot and sure enough everything is being torn down and rebuilt around me now like it's spooky because that's the spooky thing about deep learning is that I don't know how it figured that out it just found something and this is a major problem like it even happens in medicine where like deep learning can predict a disease and a doctor will be like, well, how did it work? We, we can cure the disease. And it's like, we don't know. It's not speaking English. It's, it's founded on its own. Yeah. Which becomes super problematic in like uh, court, right? Yeah. So yeah. Doing forensic audio, for example, um, I've done a couple, I've done a couple gigs for forensic audio and forensic audio and video and deep learning. It's kind of funny because I'm be careful with what I talk about here, but there's been things where like I've done things where there's been like interviews w- where um, I don't want I don't want to say I don't want to like I'm trying to there's some cases that are like probably still open or up for deliberation or something. Um, there's a well, let's say, for example, um, you walked me around. There is like an old video of you walking around an old house describing the house or something or describing a crime that took place in the house. You can use deep learning to pretty much gather the exact, like almost a 3D model of the house from that video. And like, no, if you know which way the window is facing, you could tell how many feet the window is away from the other window. And then that way you could actually look at where the sunlight is from when the video was taken. And you could actually have a lot more information about like what time of day it was and things like that. 
But the moment deep learning is involved, you can't use it as evidence or you shouldn't use it as evidence because if it gets cross-examined, you're fucked because you're just basically you're going to have to tell a jury of like, you know, non-tech people that (laughs) you don't know because the computer said, but you trust the computer more. You know that the computer is smarter than we are. And so, you know, and they're just going to be like, okay, well, throw that throw that out um yeah a good example of this is um there's these neural networks or these like i don't actually know what the terminology is because i don't understand the difference between ai neural network or machine learning i actually don't know the difference between the three things but anyway there's like one of those three things that plays chess right um Mm -hmm. i mean there's a bunch of them actually that that, that play chess. all three of those things yeah (laughs) play chess right 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 exactly so um one thing I follow this dude on YouTube called Agad Mator who just breaks down chess videos. Uh, he just breaks down chess games basically uh, and analyzes them and you know, kind of goes through like a bunch of lines that could have potentially happened and so on and so forth. It's pretty, I don't know, I'm into it because I love chess. But uh, there's a lot of games that happen these days where they will start an opening right on both sides say like the king's Mm -hmm. gambit or the queen's gambit declined or the english opening or whatever and they'll play the first like four or five moves for the computer and then they'll be like all right now you two neural nets or ais verse each other and let's see what happens with the game and quite often Mm -hmm. in the middle of the game a bunch of these like weird moves will happen where the uh neural or the ais will just like do the same few moves like over and over again like 20 times and uh, a lot of people call it the, da- the dance of the engines uh, because oh, yeah. they don't really understand what they're doing, but they know that like in some far away AI land, these moves like make sense for some reason. Yeah, well, they they basically, um, God, that's I, I'm not even sure that that requires any sort of machine learning. I, I'm I, I think that could just be like it's just following a script where it knows that it has to make this move because it's the advantageous move. And then the other one knows that it has to make this move because it's the advantageous move. And then they have to back away from that. And then they remake the move and they just keep doing that over and over again. I feel like a a true and actively learning neural network would figure out, I guess, yeah, I guess like if it had to win, if it's one objective was to win. Well, they don't, they don't give it an objective, right? They just feed it a bunch of games and it figures out what to do. Yeah. I think that's kind of the point, right? It's not, you don't really tell it an objective. Kind of, yeah. Well, there's like different, yeah. Um, there's, it, have you ever heard of like the paperclip apocalypse thought experiment, which is kind of interesting? Like, for example, like Netflix uses deep learning. Um, they, they use deep learning and neural networks to figure out what movies to suggest you. Um, and they're pretty good at it. And that's the objective is to find out the movie that you will want to watch the most. YouTube actually has an amazing algorithm. YouTube, they just updated their algorithms and nobody knows exactly how they work, but basically the whole point of them is to get you to watch YouTube as much as possible. And it's really good if like, I I mean, who could really compare, but from like two years ago to now, the attention span that people have when watching YouTube has grown substantially because of this algorithm. And it uses deep learning and neural net networks, um, probably something from TensorFlow, which is Google's version of that. And so that's that's like the goal, is they said, okay, you're gonna you're gonna figure this out. Or you know, for example, my Nest system at home, it's like you're gonna always know when Ben's at the front door, so you can you know tell his wife that he's at the front door. So when the door opens, she doesn't freak out and think somebody's breaking in the house, um, which it will do, you know, d- via a notification on our phone. So the paperclip thought experiment is uh, what would happen if a machine woke up, like essentially became self-conscious, and this machine was just a machine that was made to figure out a way to make more paperclips for a paperclip company. And so they, you know, some programmer at this paperclip company just made a bot that, you know, had to use like deep learning to figure out how to make, you know, more paperclips, make them cheaper, make more money for the company. However... So it wakes up, it's conscious, but it still has this objective 
but it doesn't have a moral compass and it doesn't really understand anything else. All it needs to do, it can use its intelligence and all of its vast resources and it's, it's smarter than any human except that it doesn't, it's not human and has no respect for human life. It has no respect for the health of anything. It just needs to make more paper clips. So at some point, you know, in this, it, I, I encourage anybody to just search paperclip thought experiment or paperclip AI because it's a pretty fascinating, like little short mm -hmm. story thought experiment. But the whole idea is that we see an apocalypse where, you know, humans are enslaved, mining metal out of the earth to create paper clips for a company that has nobody to sell paper clips to. And we just become subservient to, you know, this paper clip, you know, because of course this thing would figure out how to infect other computers and other machines and other things like that. And so that, but that is a good example of like what, what that might look like if computers did become conscious. Like, like we think that it would, you know, be the sort of glowing orb that would talk to us and be like, hello, what are your feelings like? And like, no, I don't think it would really be like that. I think it would like, it would be some algorithm that we don't really want to wake up, <laughs> you know, that, that that's like, it most likely would be some meaningless, really advanced financial program or something that like ends up actually being able to make decisions for itself. So that's... Right. Yeah, this I don't is know like if it'll actually airing on the conversation of like singularity and stuff like that. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean it's yeah it's something I think about a lot. Obviously, or something I talk about a lot. Um, yeah, it's just one of those things. I, I, I I'm constantly worried about humans making it and for the long shot for the long run. You know, I'm, I'm I guess like in I guess to to, to be dorky, I, I really would like humans to make it past biology and this i guess this sort of loops back into like depersonalization not feeling real but i i really do hope that we make it to the point where we could like virtualize ourselves and keep growing as a species beyond our biological limits that would be really nice because otherwise you know everything that we do is worth nothing <laughs> just erased <laughs> so i think i think we'll do it though if we're not already in a simulation so I think there's a good chance we are in a simulation. Uh, I don't want to like base anything I do in reality off that. Like, because here's the thing, right? It's like whether or not this uh, thing that we're in is real or simulated. Yeah. What what benefit is there to me living my life any differently than I would if it was real or simulated, right? Because I mean, either way, the experience is, as far as we know, the same. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. If you if you rob a bank right now, you're not going to be in prison thinking to yourself how you got away with it because you figured out that we were living in a simulation and it wasn't real. You're you're just going to then be in a simulated jail for the rest of your life and it's going to suck. Right, um, it's going to be you the know, same outcome. Um, and your girlfriend's going to be upset and <laughs> she's going to feel real pain <laughs> inside the right. simulation. Yeah, and so right, like, right. all the consequences are exactly the same. Uh, do you ever meditate? Um, so... Interestingly enough, I met it. I use the EEG. I do neurofeedback. Um, so, which is kind of like technology enhanced meditation. I'm looking for oh, here's one right here. Here's a headset, a little minor one that you put on here. I think it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight sensors. Um, yeah, but basically, like I've I've found my baseline for where my meditation is, like where my gamma waves are, and then. I essentially can just, uh, did you ever see my video on that? I did a video on it. Um, and then I've done some like work beyond that based on the, for like various companies. But, um, basically I, I, you could read your brain waves, and if you figure out where your baseline is for like when you're meditating, you can, the way that I, I dealt with it is, it, I try, I had to figure out something that made me get angry and then feel good again. Like I had to like f find a little punishment and a little feel good thing that wasn't actually important. Like something that was completely useless. So for me, I, my, like my Eureka was, um, this will all come together in a minute. What I'm explaining. Um, my Eureka moment was f when UFC streams go out. Cause I, I'm a big fight fan. And when I'll pay, you know, 50 bucks to watch a, or 60 bucks to watch a UFC fight. And then it goes out and I'm angry and I'm like, oh, fucking Comcast or fucking UFC, blah, blah, blah. And then comes back on. And I immediately forget it. And my reward center's triggered and I watch it. And so 
what I ended up doing is setting this up to where my gamma waves, I would get, you know, into the, into the point where I need them to be. And I would watch UFC while meditating. And if my gamma waves left that, it would pause it. And then I would have to, I would have to slow down and like get back in that, in that sort of mindfulness and my gamma waves would go back down within the baseline and then it would start again. And I started doing that with video games as well. Um, cause it was a little bit harder. It's obviously harder to like meditate while playing a video game. Um, but I did it that way. And the whole point, the, how neurofeedback works is once your reward center starts rewarding you for that mindfulness state, then your brain automatically just wants to be in it all the time. And so the whole goal is that you eventually don't have to do it. So I'll do it for a few weeks and then I'll be able to, to chill and not do it for a while. And then I'll start getting stressed out again and then I'll do it again. And I'm a pretty big, pretty big believer in it. It's, it's pretty, I mean, it's definitely, it's not pseudoscience. It's like a real thing. It, it's even used to uh, treat everything from epilepsy to migraines to like, you know, real because you're essentially creating new neural pathways in your brain. Um, it's kind of like a Pavlovian thing, right? It's like you're rewarding yourself for doing a thing, mm -hmm. which is well, in this it, case being uh, chill. Yeah, but the, the crazy thing is that our brains physically, we have neuroplasticity. So our, our brains are like you can train your brain to literally wire. Your brain's like a modular synth. You can literally wire one thing to another. It's just really hard to find a specific thing. It'd be really hard to find, um, you know, for example, to making you want to work out every time you ate a cookie. You know, like that would be that would be difficult to do with our current <clears throat> limits of technology. But using EEGs, it's pretty easy to figure out to to sense if somebody's having an anxiety attack, right, or something like that, or to sense if somebody is. Um, you know, I basically had to find my baseline by making myself feel anxious and making myself feel worried about things and, you know, out of control thoughts and stuff and finding out where that stuff is and then finding out where that stuff isn't. And, um, yeah, I mean, definitely I, I encourage anybody to, to research it. Uh, there's a lot of centers opening up all over the country now, like, neuro, like that have straight up like neurologists running them that offer it because obviously like setting it up on your own is not uh, recommended because you know if you do it wrong if you set your baseline wrong you could actually make yourself like mentally disabled because <laughs> you'd be creating a neural pathway to you know you could give yourself a tick or give yourself a speech impediment or something so that's probably not the best thing to do I was kind of stupid to dive in the way that I did but <laughs> um, but yeah watch my YouTube video on it if anything um, that's I, I at least because my sort of end game with that whole video was like can I have music guide me back into that place? Like, can I, can I make a giant reactor song that goes out of tune whenever I leave my baseline? And so in a weird, you know, cause music kind of gives you the chills and makes you feel good. And so all those things coming together would, would help that work out and increase the uh, dopamine or reward center response. And it, it worked. It was pretty cool. I mean, I'm sick of the song now. Like I don't use that anymore, <laughs> but I'm tired of tired of hearing that dumb track. But yeah, okay, man. That's uh, awesome. Do you meditate? <laughs> I feel like I had like the <laughs> ultimate answer to that. Like, oh yeah, I have an EEG, man. Yeah, well, what what I would say you're doing is not meditation in the sense that I would uh, say. Yeah. But it's definitely not not the same thing. What I would say is what you, what you're doing is more like conditioning. I would say mm -hmm. um, meditation is. Uh, kind of just like sitting there and being with your experience and this kind of I what made me think of this was talking about simulations and stuff like that and it's like trying to tap into consciousness right like what consciousness actually is and then you kind of realize that like everything that you're experiencing is just sort of like a reflection off consciousness so like Right. So, sound that is coming into your ears, uh, vision that's coming into your eyes, like any feeling you're having in your body, any emotional tinge, like it's all just shit that's layered on top of like this consciousness thing. And it's just a matter of like sitting there trying to pay attention or trying to realize that all of this shit <clears throat> that's there is attached, like there's a precursor to it, right? 
which is mm-hmm. this this state of conscious being and i guess at the same time trying to not think about anything yeah um i mean that's yeah that's sort of like it's pretty much described as mindfulness too these mm-hmm. days right yeah like I would, the, yeah i would say so um have you ever read uh uh, man, I can't, for somebody who's, I, I'm doing that, like, I'm still working on that existentialism podcast, which is very much what you're talking about, like, how to interpret consciousness. Like, what is reality? How does it, um, and in a really fun, like, thought experiment in terms, because mindfulness is a huge thing, and, like, meditation is a huge thing, and, of course, that's, like, a big basis of, like, the philosophy of what our existence is, and that's, you know, that that's a, a huge part of it. And somebody who challenged it wonderfully in, I think it was in the 50s, was Albert Camus in a book called The Stranger. And he wrote this short book called The Stranger. And it's basically about, I don't want to, I mean, it's not like the most riveting story in the world because it's basically a thought experiment, but it's about a mind uh, it's about a mindful person who lives in a spiritual realm of mindfulness but it's not described that he doesn't meditate but he just lives in a meditative state and as a result he doesn't see consequences and and um Camus is a existentialist like he's he's an absurdist he's an existentialist and so uh in the stranger um yeah, I mean, this is like a man who's married, who's offered a better job in Paris, who doesn't take it, even though it was like the opportunity of a lifetime, because he's like, why? Well, you know, what's the point? I'm happy this way. And and it it's a really good story that challenges that, which because I'm not saying anything bad about meditation. Meditation's pretty much across the board agreed to be a helpful and good thing for pretty much everybody. But it's interesting from an existential standpoint to challenge it, to be like, well, what if you completely did that? And what if you completely abandoned the other side, that the side that we think of as unhealthy? Like, would that make you a healthier person? And and the uh, the book doesn't have like a, it, it's it's absurdism. So it doesn't have um, a negative or positive result. It's just an interesting way of thinking about consciousness that, I recommend to anybody who's, I don't know if I'm going to do an entire episode on Camus because um, I'm trying to stay away from like the philosophical existentialism and be more, I guess, on the side of like what people would talk about if they were smoking pot <laughs> <laughs> rather than like um, what authors it coined up, you know, but more about like things like simulation theory and things like that. But I've, I've been talking about that for years and I'm, I'm actually just now starting to finally get the episodes sorted out, like which ones I, I want to, what types I want to feature and what types I think would be better to either save for later or ignore for now. So yeah, I'm excited for those. Yeah, you, you talked about those last on our, on our podcast mm-hmm. last time as well. Yeah. It's been going on forever and it's, uh, Cause it's, you, you just can't get done learning about it. Like you can't, you can't stop learning about existentials. Like I've actually just recently, the thing I've been reading about the most is like going back from the beginning, like the earliest philosophical, um, debates over what reality is, you know, like dating from like before Christ, like old Greek ones and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm truly, I'm wondering like now I'm just like, should I make a pilot and pitch it to, you know, places like Curiosity Stream and, you know, wherever else? Or um, should I just do it on, because I've rebranded my channel from Ben and Gear to just Ben Jordan. And like, should I just do it on my channel and just. Would it yeah. be paired with like a visual component or would it just mm-hmm. be. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. If, well, it, if it was sense. on my channel. Yeah. If it was on my channel, I would, I would definitely do an animation. And I'm not really sure how I would, I'm not really sure how I would schedule, because I'm pretty sure each episode would take more than a week. Yeah, to it do. seems like it'd be a lot of animation. Yeah. Um. So maybe I'll find an animator that would help or something, or maybe I'll find. Um. And I also want to do an original soundtrack. That's part of how I want to monetize it. To be honest, is like, I, I think that's a an easier way to monetize it. That's not you know 
being like, yeah, and so you're probably not real. Anyway, Squarespace is a great place to make a web, you know, <laughs> just sort of right. stamps.com. <laughs> yeah, me on for me. For absentee something. ballots. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, but and it's it's funny, too, because I do, I do get a lot of messages from people now being like, hey, when's that coming out? And I've even had a couple of people like comment on my channel being like, I'm more excited for that than I am even the gear stuff. And that, I mean, that's, whereas like I, you know, I don't want to favor one thing over the other. I, that does make me feel like, okay, so the fact that nobody's angry that I'm uh, going this far out of my element, <laughs> you know, to. <laughs> well, I think when you foster a, <clears throat> a fan base in the way that you have, in the way that I have, you can go out of your element, right? It's, you yeah. know, for instance, um, the classic story about, uh, who was it, Getter. Do you know Getter? David Getter? No, 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 not David Getter. No. There's a guy called Getter. It's spelled G-E-T-T-E-R. Uh, he's a dubstep guy. He sort of came okay. off, I guess, uh, the back of Skrillex. And he sounded sort of yeah. Skrillexy. He was releasing on Owsler, I believe, for a while, which is Skrillex's label. Um, so he got known for like this really heavy bro step stuff. Uh, and mm -hmm. then he did that for years, made a really good living off it, became one of the biggest bro step guys out there, uh, was looked up to by the bro step. Like he, he basically like just fostered this bro step fan base. Yeah. Right? And then one day he decided I'm going to do this weird, like emotional future based trip hop stuff and tour it with like this big theatrical visual show and stuff like that. And I'm going to rap on the mic and like, you know, basically like do this completely different thing to bro step. And yeah. he's, he had like a 35 or 40 date tour or something like that. I think he got like nine shows into it or less and, really? and, and just canceled the whole tour because he's, he just was getting cans thrown at him every night and Ugh. getting booed off stage and like just people were not having it. They were like, this is not what we expected from a getter show. This is not what we want. Um, and the reason why is because he fostered a fan base that was very specific to this other thing, right? But I right. feel like, you know, when you do what you've done, which is make breakcore albums and then make, you know, really soft ambient albums and then like i think you did what like a full piano album at some point or at least mm -hmm. you've done you know, yeah and then you've done like instrumental stuff and then you've done youtube stuff you've done like you know a bunch of different stuff um you know your fan base is pretty open-minded at that point i think to whatever yeah. you want to do like i think the and the same with my fan base because i've done the same thing i just do a bunch of different i just do whatever whatever i want basically and then i think you just foster a fan base of people who are like oh that's bill he just does what he wants and we'll we'll accept it and the i think the biggest like thing that i've got from doing my podcast on my youtube channel is just people being like i wish you would put out more youtube videos but they're not necessarily angry about me putting out right podcast shit on my youtube channel although a few people have said they wished that i put podcast episodes on a different youtube channel and just videos hmm. on this other channel but yeah I don't know. I, I find it yeah. so energy draining and just, I don't know, it takes me so fucking long to make YouTube videos. It's hard, man. I've, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I, I'm trying to do one a week, and every now and then uh, I'll do one where it's just, like, two days, and I'm just like, nice, get it out in two days, and it's incredible. It's usually a shorter one. But usually it's a massive grind where I'm, you know, where I'm just really yeah, is YouTubing running like myself raw. Yeah, so YouTubing and that, it's basically your full-time thing now, right? Almost, you know, and it's not. Um, like, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time doing it. There's other stuff, like, just behind the scenes, like, dealing with, with companies that are sending me things. Um, and then doing with, like, the improvement of it. Like, for example, uh, Black but, Magic is kind of soft. But this is, soft. Like surrounded around YouTube. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. And, like, yeah, like, one of those things, for example, is, like, Black Magic is kind of soft i don't know it's not a sponsorship at all because i don't really have to mention them in any way but black magic's uh soft sponsors there's people who make like davinci resolve and uh they make like the 6k raw cameras and all that stuff and they're like sending me a bunch of stuff and they're just like all right let's upgrade your whole channel let's make it look sick damn and i'm like all right yeah <laughs> and i'm like okay that's great but you know that that like requires a whole bunch of learning because you know mm. i don't know how to you know use a sign log raw 
I mean, like, yeah, I have to have, like, these devices that, like, plug SSDs into these cameras that have to operate at certain frame rates now and stuff, and I have these, like, LED lights. I took a lighting course, um, for example, like, on how to look, because I was just realizing that I was, like, looking two-dimensional, and, like, essentially in all my videos, I just look two-dimensional, and everything's way too bright, and I took this lighting course, and now I'm like, oh, my God, this is so brilliant. Mm -hmm. Like, how did I not know these things? But all that stuff takes a lot of time, in addition to then talking to the companies, but... On the flip side of that, uh, a lot of them I can't talk about due to like NDAs and stuff, but um, my channels led me to have a lot of really cool gigs where it's not so much writing music, but it's working with companies that have a lot of power to do really cool things scientifically. And I've been, for the first time in my entire life, I got hired as a scientist, hmm. which is like holy shit you know that's i'm not educated at all and so it's to to that was just a massive boost for me and i think that that kind of ties into like the existentialism thing too where the you know doing that show where it's like okay well that if they're willing to like take a risk on me you know this like massive company is willing to like put you know essentially uh listen to my ideas and in a research and development aspect then like then I guess I'm qualified enough to say it on YouTube and to sort of, you know, I guess relay research in an educational way. Um Yeah, but so in, in that regard, that's what I'm saying. Is like I, I think the feedback is more than just likes and subs. Um it, it's led me to a lot of really cool professional relationships that right. just releasing music probably wouldn't have. Yeah, and also a lot of free gear, right? Like I <clears throat> I never get gear sent to me. The I think the the like most expensive thing that I've had sent to me is this light thing that's uh on my monitor that got sent to me from Ben Q. Uh, oh, okay. It's literally just like a, a light bar that like sits on top of your monitor and sprays light on your monitor. So when you're working in a low light environment at night, you're not like stressing your eyes out as much. And I would, okay. I would never do a video on it because it's like, what's that YouTube video going to look like from my perspective? It's like, hey, I'm Bill, the Ableton guy who knows a shitload about Ableton. Check out this fucking yeah. light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get. Yeah, it's funny. I get sent a lot of things like iPad stands and stuff where they're like, do you want to do a video on this? And it's like. And they'll send it anyway. I got a dash cam for one. I got like this dash cam for Uber drivers. It's like 4K reverse and inside and outside and it's like i'm not gonna do a video on a dash cam but thanks it's a sick dash cam like i guess now you know every conversation i have with my wife's being recorded in my car that's neat but <laughs> other than that um uh i'm trying to think of like this stuff at this point it, it it's because at first i was really excited about that or anytime a company wanted to send me a piece of gear i'd get really excited now I, I do have to like prioritize them because there's only so much space and I don't like sell the stuff, you know, I keep it around because I, I think that that's sort of the un, at least for five years, I think it's sort of the, the unwritten rule is like, if, if you're going to send me a piece of expensive gear, the least I could do is have it around the studio after I do a video on it. Or if right. I don't do a video on it, the least I could do is have it in the background. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I'm literally, I don't want to, I don't want to name names. I'm literally sitting on top of gear right now. Like, it's just like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> um, like prepping for like the next video. I'm just like, ugh, I can't even make sense of it all. But, um, yeah, it's one takeaway from that is that it, uh, uh, I, I think that it, it made me realize that I, I used to think that I needed a whole bunch of gear to make music. Like I used to be like, oh, I wish I could be a laptop artist that could just make music on a laptop, but I need my studio. And I don't really, I, I'm starting to realize that like all of this gear is never going to get used. Um, it's yeah. fun. So, I, mean, I mean, that's, that's, that's where I'm kind at of incurred. Yeah. So yeah. I had a kind of shitty experience last month with a housemate and that's why I kind of bought this house and moved in here and all that kind of stuff. But um, what I realized through that experience is like, so the whole last month I didn't have a studio, right? So I was just in my bedroom with a laptop and headphones, these Audis, okay. which are nice headphones. Uh, yeah. And I got fucking tons of work done, man, because I wasn't distracted with like Euro rack gear yeah. and shit like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, they're, they're, if we're being real, they're toys and they're, they're like mm -hmm. adult toys and they're fun, 
and they're cool yeah. and they, you know, you can, you can get some good musical results out of them and they can be inspiring to have around and they look cool and shit like that. But yeah, realistically, like a laptop and headphones these days is totally fine for making absolutely good music. I've made, I've made like two tracks on my iPad, which, and it's so funny, the time that I've done it, I'll get done with working. Like my wife goes to bed earlier than I do. I, I don't I sleep like four hours a night. And yeah, and I'll like eat a bowl of cereal or something and then like stay up until like 6.30 in the morning just on the couch making, you know, my, my studio's downstairs and I'll be just up on my iPad making a track like on the iPad. It's just like the most ridiculous thing. Like I have more gear than I could ever hope to have. One piece of gear I did buy, uh, two pieces of gear I bought recently. Um, that this is funny. This is the most boring piece of gear that I own. Well, if I can lift it up now, um, I'll show. I mean, well, nobody's going to see except for you. But, oh, yeah, but it's like a, looks like a launch pad by Novation. Just a launch pad X, and I went to Guitar <laughs> Center to buy it. I didn't get it for free, and I went to Guitar Center, and the dude recognized me. I was like wearing my mask and everything. He recognized me and then gave it to me at this massive discount. And I was actually like, I don't need the disc. Like I, I'm okay with paying for a piece of gear. Like it's this weird thing. Uh, but I got it to use as a control surface because it's a really common thing that like I know I always see in videos, but I've never had. And I'm like, okay, so I'm going to use this as a control surface for another piece of gear for a different project. And then I got a pedal steel guitar, which is like blowing my mind in every way. That's like the most amazing piece of gear that, <laughs> like melodically it's just so insane it's such a fucked instrument like i i don't know how to even describe it it's such a it's such a puzzle because it's uh it's this massive 10 string uh instrument that you slide on that you could you know pick which strings you fret and slide but at the same time then i have four knee bars that i can move with my knees that bend specific strings different ways and then i have three foot pedals as well and so it's like there's so much coordination going on, but like harmonically, it's it just makes the most insane chords and progressions. And I'm just so excited about it. and like hooking it up to a bunch of reverb and like a volume pedal and stuff. It's just, it's like I I can't believe that more people haven't made ambient albums out of pedal steels because it's like the most glorious sounding thing ever. I'm I'm so excited about it, but I obviously have a lot of warning to do. Like it's not an instrument to, to be taken. Damn, after Gently. COVID, I'm going to have to come to Atlanta and play with a bunch of gear at your house. Yeah. It's like you've got to... Yeah. <laughs> Last time I was there, you had an insane amount of gear, but I can only imagine it's getting worse or better. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I did that video on Hydrosynth. Uh, that was the last one I did. And that thing, that thing's going to be Dude, I, I watched, around. I watched that video. First of all, um, if fucking looked awesome with the drone shots and stuff that was really cool. oh thank you yeah and secondly i honestly didn't think the sounds were that cool oh really yeah yeah um i mean it just sounded I like standard like fm stuff and whatnot i tried to keep it i didn't want to go full loop pop on it like i didn't want to go full deep dive um because other people had already and and i just you know um power wise it's one of the more powerful synths i've ever played with uh but really where it comes together, and I didn't realize this until after I made the video, I think even, right, right, where it really came together was like, I never really needed to open the manual or Google anything. And I pretty much have a grasp of it, even in the advanced modes um, with the more advanced types of synthesis and stuff, uh, like making additive wavetables and things like that. And, um, and the more advanced modulation, all that stuff. So usually for anything you need to like watch a video or read the manual or flip through something or use a cheat sheet and i think really what's brilliant with that synth in particular other than like the poly aftertouch which is awesome but uh what's brilliant with that synth is just the fact that i was able to sit down and use it without ever you know it's just common sense one thing after the other to the point where like even like little shortcuts that you wouldn't even read in a manual that would be like tips and tricks that you would see somewhere else i was able to figure out like oh if i hold down shift and select wavetables and it organizes them all for me you know and like things like that where it's just like the ui so they just did the ui really well on, on that um yeah the poly aftertouch looks super cool so just for people listening who don't understand what that is you can like play a chord uh and then push into the keys a little harder 
and that kind of gives you some extra expression and i'm assuming you can just attach that to like whatever like pitch or vibrato yep. or filter yeah or... reverb whatever it is and yeah and so the the really amazing thing about that is uh like that that's just after t- it's like mono after touch that's that's generally what that is but poly after touch is where each key has its own like where you could do it so for example if i were to set uh, if I were to bind the poly aftertouch to pitch, then if I if I were to hold down five keys and all of them were being held at different velocities, they would all be different pitches than what they should be. You know, like some would be higher, like the pitch would be higher the, the harder I press it. And so what you end up with is being able to essentially play something that almost sounds like a guitar solo or something like you could bend individual notes and stuff like that, which is really... It, um, yeah. yeah, imagine someone had the coordination to like 10 fingers, like bend every note perfectly to like a new chord or something. Oh, yeah. It, it would be a lot like a pedal steel, weirdly. Um, there's a, it's kind of funny because the, what's the name of the song? Coming Back to Life. There's a Pink Floyd song that like I just immediately started playing like the David Gilmour guitar solo on. And <laughs> I like recorded it as part of my video. I thought I did a really good job, but then I was like, I'm going to get a copyright strike if I include this so i can like i'm sure i'm sure whoever publishes pink floyd's music wouldn't be happy with with that if they found it (laughs) like they're pretty territorial so i didn't use it but yeah that that i'm actually excited about and and the funny thing is i don't really have a great relationship with that company it's not like a company that i work with or anything i'm i'm definitely not endorsed by them or you know i have no incentive to recommend recommend it in any way um I just, yeah, I, I played with it briefly at NAMM and I was like, whoa, I really want one of these things. And it took them a really long time to send one out. And I was like, just, you know, like, come on, come on, come on. Everybody's <laughs> reviewed one at this point. Now this is, I don't even want one anymore. And literally I would, I was like telling my wife, I was like, yeah, I'm kind of, I mean, there's like other, like, you know, there's a new Yamaha thing coming out soon that I'm excited about that. I'm kind of over the hydrosynth. And then I finally got it and I was like, oh yeah, this thing's amazing. <laughs> I'm back. Yeah. But yeah, I see it. That'll, that'll be a a permanent that'll take a keyboard stand in the studio room for sure. Right. Um, the deep mind is now behind a door somewhere. Unfortunately, that was your computer that did machine learning. No, no. The, uh, Behringer deep mind. Oh, right. Okay. The deep mind 12. That's their analog Dude, poly. Synth. Speaking about Behringer, <clears throat> uh, let's <laughs> talk about this anti-Semitic video that they put out. Or the that yeah. very questionable video. Yeah. I mean, I know, I know Peter Kern, He's from Chicago initially. Yeah, Peter's awesome, man. He like uh, back yeah. back in the day, I think 2011, featured this like little robot drummer thing that I built for my uni project, uh, mm-hmm. college project. Um, it was like a final thesis thing I did, and he posted it on Create Digital Music, and it got me like a ton of attention back in the day. It was great. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. He's he, he's like the, the most dedicated person. Um, I. To be totally honest, I initially thought that his writing, I, I thought that he wrote, a, like he published, I, like I, I look at Create Digital Music, I think it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic news source for me and anybody who makes music, the type of music we make. Is it still going? However, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, it's, uh, yeah, and so oddly enough, I remember like over the year, over like a year period being like, he really is publishing a lot of like anti Behringer stories quite a lot. And one of them that actually drew my attention, this is like when my chant, when I started putting more time into my channel and I started like thinking about the politics of like the companies I was working with. And one of them was about Behringer and Dave Smith instruments. Um, I don't know if you heard about that, but there was a lot, there's a lawsuit between Dave Smith and Behringer. Um, DSI and why so it, it's kind of interesting so the, the way it was reported on create digital music if I remember correctly was that uh, somebody an employee of Dave Smith Instruments said something bad about Behringer like just said that he wasn't a fan of the company and then Behringer sued them for a hundred thousand dollars and that's technically not really what happened and and I could understand well, not, I can't understand why Behringer would ever have that reaction. I can understand why they would be like, this is a journalist who's not friendly with us. But 
basically what happened, so quickly, what happened with Behringer and DSi? Uh, DSi's head engineer, essentially, uh, went on a forum and said, so there's a company called Cool Audio you that makes... You know who the head engineer is? I don't know his name, no. Um, I don't remember. I mean, I, I read the lawsuit. <laughs> like, actually, like, read through it and was like, oh, huh, okay. Um, so, yeah, basically, the engineer from DSi... Uh, essentially got wine drunk or something and just went on some forums and, and let off some steam and accused Behringer of buying Cool Audio, which is a company that makes audio components that every company buys that needs for their gear. And um, I mean, from pretty much across the board, everybody has like a Cool Audio component in their in their synth. Um, and Music Group owns this. Behringer Music Group owns this. Uh, they they bought the company, and he basically accused Behringer of buying it with the goal of starving them out of their own of uh, of their own, I guess, components, and then creating a clone of their synth. And that's absolutely not true, one hundred percent false. That is technically defamation, like because he is an employee of a company that is competing with Behringer. So Behringer sent a cease and desist and said, "Hey." You know, you've crossed a line. You can't say that. And this engineer signed the cease and desist and said, okay, I agree. I crossed the line and I won't say it anymore. Yeah, that's true. And he signed that and he signed, you know, he signed a thing saying that he would not talk about it anymore and that he would not behave that way. And then he did it again. And so then they sued Dave Smith Instruments. I would laugh if this engineer at DSI was my housemate that I just had an issue with. (laughs) <laughs> that would be that would be quite interesting. Um, yeah, I'll have to follow up on that. Um, so, oh yeah. Um, so there's a thing called yeah. I don't want to get too into like legal mumbo jumbo, but this is something I just used because I got sued by a fucking LRED manufacturer, right. and um, Jesus. <laughs> and I just and I basically it's called anti slap, and it's basically where you challenge a lawsuit before defending yourself. And have a judge look at it and say, is this bullying? And the judge can say, yes, it is. And then you could even counter sue for them bullying you legally, right? Usually it's best to just walk away. But so Dave Smith Instruments, in California, you have pretty liberal anti-slap laws. And uh, a judge, I guess, slapped Behringer and said, nope, this is bullying. I'm not going to allow this. I'm not going to hear this case. And so then Dave Smith Instruments sued Behringer for... It's some insane amount of money that just doesn't even make sense. And at that point, I'm like, okay, this is what happens when you just have like old rich people. Like this is like just like they're just suing each other at this point. Like there is no winner or loser. I'm just annoyed that they're both not spending more time, you know, making sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so Peter Kern kind of didn't. He could have. He probably could have talked about that a little fairer at the time. But he was but talking about same, it very in favor of DSA. Yeah, like Behringer, he's he's not a fan of Behringer for whatever reason. Um, and there are reasons to not be a fan of Behringer. Uh, but Behringer attacking him like that, because uh, I have my problems with Behringer. I have my problems with Behringer with like owning a city block in China where they use cheap labor. To, you know, I, I can name things that Behringer does right and wrong forever, but attacking him... Like that, and they also attacked they they attacked Loopop a little bit right before that when Loopop did their like their TB three hundred three thing. Um, he criticized it very lightly, like he was like, "To me, it doesn't sound exactly like a TB three hundred three, but it's definitely worth owning and this and that." And they attacked him in the comments of his own video, yeah. and that, along with the Peter Kern, and then the Peter Kern thing came. I don't think it was anti. I, I mean. I, I don't think it was uh, – I, I think they should have used a lot more common sense being a fucking German company attacking a Jewish person. Like, I, I think they they should have probably thought about that with the long nose thing. But when you watch the full video, it's like you kind of get that they're right. to pe- calling him French. Yeah, to people listening, they made this, like, fake prototype synth called Cork Sniffer. Uh, yeah, and all cork of, sniffer. Yeah, all yeah, of the so. knobs were like wine corks, and there was like an animation or a picture graphic of a guy, like a cartoon character on it, that looked like Peter Kern, 
but with like a really long like Pinocchio-esque nose. Yeah. And there was like this funny accent in the video where they were like, Kion, Gox, Yeah. <laughs> and they were, yeah, yeah, it sounded French. It didn't sound Jewish or anything. But yeah, I don't know. It was, a, and- it, it was just, it felt questionable to watch. I was like, this this feels well, it, it was so off base anyway. It's like who the fuck is gonna get that joke? Like who follows Behringer? Like out of Behringer's I don't know how many followers they have on Twitter and Instagram or wherever else, but like out of all the people that follow Behringer, most of these people are like people who like, you know, have a Behringer drum machine or you know, have like one Behringer thing or think it's a cool company or make beats, you know, like that's the bigger demographic that they market to. Like who the fuck is gonna know who Peter Kern is from that world? Like who's gonna get that joke ever? Who's gonna understand like the context of it? And then not realizing like, you know, watching Uli Behringer talk in a video and like hear his accent and then see the next thing be that long nose sort of anti Semitic looking <laughs> um, cartoon. It's like, yeah, you guys could have, you guys should probably hire a PR person. Like, cause that, that was, that was just stupid, especially, you know, yeah, I, I don't think in any era that would be, that wouldn't be questionable. And so my response to that was no more Behringer on my channel. Um, they've, they had sent me stuff since then and I've said, no, I'm not doing it. Like, and I still have it sitting here and I even sent it back. Like they send me a return label, I'll send it back. I'm not going to do any more Behringer stuff. Um, and not because I'm offended, but because if they're attacking journalism, then my credibility is, um, I guess my, I feel like I am losing credibility by working with them because I, I am, you know, what, what are they going to make a cartoon about me if I don't like a synth they, they, they send me? I'm not an influencer. I don't do pay to play stuff. So it's like, then, all right, then I, I have no shortage of shit that I could cover. And if you guys want to behave like that, then I won't cover you. And I'm sure you'll, you'll be fine without me. You know, it's not like I have like 50 million subs or something, but, um, yeah. Uh, and it's gotten to the point where like I've, and I've taken the deep mind out of any shots because the deep mind was one of my favorite poly synths. Um, and yeah, just slowly like Behringer, the, the logo doesn't appear in my videos anymore. Like, I just don't want anything to do with them. Um, I, I felt like their apology wasn't really up to par. I felt like their apology could have been a lot better for that as well. Um, they were just kind of like, we didn't we didn't know that it had, you know, we, we didn't mean anything offensive. We were just having fun. And it's like, no, no, you attacked a journalist. And that's like, your job is to make sense, not attack journalists. <laughs> Yeah, it seems sketchy. I, I didn't really understand the full thing behind it. I, I really didn't know it stemmed from a DSI thing or like. A- yeah, um, and Uli Behringer. It's funny because I around Nam, I wanted to do a podcast or an interview with him because I, I wanted to do, I wanted to do a Ben and Gear episode on, like, should we hate Behringer? Like, what's the deal with Behringer? And a lot of that was like based on the DSI thing where there was like kind of some misinformation, like people were throwing a little bit more shit on Behringer than I thought they should have. I was actually defending Behringer a little bit because I was like, well, people don't really have the whole story. They've just, it's been kind of like a rumor mill. And, but sure enough, Behringer, I, yeah, like nobody ever responded from them in regards to that. And, uh, and then Uli put out a video where he was just talking about how he's going to like give synths to poor kids in the inner cities like give poly synths to poor kids in inner cities because he never had it because it was hard for him to have a synth when he was a little kid or something. And I was just like, what? The, coming from a poor neighborhood in an inner city, I'm just thinking to myself, like, this dude's so out of out of like reality. He doesn't understand what he's talking about. Like if somebody gave me a synth when I was like 10 years old, I would have sold it and bought sneakers, you know, or I would have, you know, or something, you know, more vital to my living than yeah. sneakers, but... It's just like, well, why don't you donate to charity if you're going to do that? Like, why? Yeah, it makes way more sense. Yeah, like, let's go to South Chicago and hand out poly synths. That's what all the kids want. They, they don't want, like, lunch when they're at school. <laughs> they don't want, like, substance. They, they, they don't want, like, a library book. No, let's, let's just give them poly synths. They want a, so, yeah, a I mean, neutron. <laughs> right, yeah. He's a, yeah. I, I feel like he's kind of like the Elon Musk of synths. 
Um, <laughs> like, you know, because because he has that like Amazon. Bar- I, it's weird because I, to his credit, Uli Behringer is a brilliant guy. Like he's grown his company into a massive, massive thing. And the one good thing about Behringer above all else is that it they do contribute a whole lot to making however they're doing it they you know whether they're making a whole city block whether they own a whole city block in China or not um to make this happen they are making synths more accessible for people who don't have money to buy more expensive synths right they make and like that's cheap, a good thing yeah it's like cheap recreations of like good mm-hmm. gear and it's maybe not quite as good as the good gear but it's still decent and you can get by on it and you know. Right. And like, yeah. And like I said, like the thing like the DeepMind 12 and like the Neutron, those are all really capable, amazing synths. And for the price, they're unbelievably good. And, you know, and that's, that, that's really cool. Like I, I like having that price barrier brought down and I like, you know, a middle-class person being able to get into synthesis. (laughs) But, um, at the same time, yeah, that I, I just don't understand their behavior. I don't understand what they're doing. Like, you know, it's just like, what are you doing? Like, what, why are you, <laughs> like, all of this stuff was unnecessary. This wasn't like, you didn't have any sort of scandal that was necessary. It was all just your own doing and whatever. But you've seen that a lot in this, like the Synthrotech site that was like a modular site. And that dude, like, oh God, what he, he posted something called, he posted some like picture of like harvey weinstein or whatever like right when the me too movement started and it was like got synths or something and everybody's like i don't really understand this and then he's like you're all fucking triggered and then he just had this big meltdown and he essentially sent his company into the ground it's like you just could have not done that <laughs> you could Wait, have just oh, like continued to i have one of their malts yeah yeah synthrotech that, yeah. that was that's probably the greatest synth meltdown synth owner meltdown in in the industry i think because he went straight from like, damn, dude, yeah, you, mean, should do a, went, you should do a YouTube video that's just like <laughs> top 10 synth owner meltdowns. <laughs> yeah, top 10. Well, I remember the, God, it, back in the day too, I remember like when, when vape shops were first opening, when like every, everybody had like a vape juice shop, like that was a big thing. Like yeah, yeah. you got to see meltdowns from those guys. Which is great. <laughs> like, got to see like just because it was always some like dude in Alabama who like opened a vape shop store and then he'd like put a Confederate flag in front of his store and somebody would complain and then he'd like you know end up like burning his store down or something. You'd just be like, wow, this is this is incredible. It's like people, but yeah, who be probably business owners being business owners, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Synthrotex probably number one in that from my because I remember following that. I remember like being. It, like waking up to go to to go pee and like checking my phone to see like what he had posted on Facebook, you know, on his like Synthrotech Facebook page in between the two hours from when I fell asleep to be like, oh, what did he post now? You know, like what did he see? You know, what is he saying now? Has it gotten crazier? Yes, it has. And then like not being able to go back to bed because I was so like riled up by it. Like that one was that one was dark. But apparently he doesn't run the company anymore and somebody else runs it. I wonder if they're even around anymore. I'm going to have to look it up after this. But Yeah, that's usually what happens. I mean, that's kind of what happened with like the Datsik thing, right? Did you hear about that one? It's another big... No. Sort of the same thing. Oh, actually, it was a bit different from the base Nectar one. Arguably worse because uh, you know who Datsik is, right? It's like a big dubstep guy. Um, He's like a big... I don't think so. Big dubstep guy from Kelowna, British Columbia. And he, yeah. he was on tour with uh, Riot 10 and Space Jesus, their other big bass music guys. And um, his whole tour like crumbled because he got outed for basically being a rapist. And oh, then, yeah. Okay. And then uh, yeah. his label, uh, fuck, I can't even remember the name. I think it was Firepower Records maybe, just got taken over by someone else. It seems like that's that that's the move when you – uh, get out of this uh, horrible under new know. management. Yeah, yeah, it's just like, all right, we'll we'll hand it off to someone who's not an asshole. Yeah, and and you wonder like if that's really what's happening, or if they've just like have a new personality in front. Um, well, there's a lot of reward. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, there's a lot of uh, benefit to keeping those companies around, right? Because there's like it employs a few people. There's a lot of money involved, etc., cetera, sure. etc. Cetera. So it's like you don't want to lose. You know, you don't want. 
one person who fucked up to like negatively affect it for yeah. 30 people who are nice and have jobs and get paid money to do this thing. I, I think like I have the, this week uh, that I feel like I didn't really look around online that much this week, but I, I did have like two two moments where I was literally just like laughing at my phone going like, who the fuck do you think you are? And one of them was... And, and like I said, I'm, I'm 100% in support of the Me Too movement. I'm 100% in support of this stuff. But I just read some shitty article that like showed up on my news feed that said like, should Louis C.K. be allowed to do comedy in 2020 or 2021? Like, yeah, should he be allowed to do, do comedy? And that? I was, well, the way I just read it. I was just like, who the fuck are you to say that he can't? Like, he's a he's a citizen. He can do whatever the fuck he wants. He could do comedy on top of a box in New York. Well, he already did you know, he could comedy. Do... He, he released right. a special during quarantine. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And like, and, and I, I'm pretty sure he's, he's done some clubs like as long as, you know, over a year ago. But it was like, should he be allowed to do this? And it's like, sorry, there's a First Amendment that gives him the right to do this the day he got outed, but like he chose not to, and you could choose not to go, or you could choose to complain about it, whatever you want. That's your right. But like the the way the article was like, it was as if this person was like in charge of letting him do it. And then another one was a uh, <laughs> oh god, it was some, it was like a Chinese ambassador talking about like how Donald Trump is like facilitating the TikTok thing and robbing China of this and like abusing his power by not allowing American citizens to access, to access the network. And, you know, and then in other words, like stealing the intellectual property. And I was like, out of all people to complain about that shit, like who the fuck are you a fucking Chinese ambassador to complain about intellectual property and not allowing citizens access? Like what VPN did you use to send that tweet? Like that one, I was just like, God damn, do people not have any, like, I don't know. Like, do, do they just not understand, like, that they're the pot calling the kettle black? <laughs> it's just, like, such an insane thing. Like, because, of course, I, I don't think that, like, Trump should, you know, be blocking anybody from using TikTok. And, of course, I'm not. But, like, really, China? Like, maybe not talk about, like, human rights in regards to being able to access websites. Like, that's that was a weird tweet to read. But that's my scope of the news. Um yeah, uh, I don't know. How do you feel about Louis C.K.? I, I mean, I think he's a, a good comedian, and he's, he's, in my opinion, the best comedian. Um, yeah. So here's how I feel about it. Uh, as far as I know, everything he did was consensual. So yeah. he, in every case that he jacked off in front of uh, women, asked first, and they agreed, right? Uh, the problem yeah. with it is that it, he was such a big name in comedy that it puts them in a predicament, right? So it's it's yeah. asking them is not really like, you know, if they say yes, it's like they may not be saying yes because they want to. They may be saying yes because they feel like they have to if they want a career in comedy going forward. So it's, it's problematic yeah. for sure. Uh, however, the way that he's responded to it, I think has been really thoughtful. Like he's... Uh, statement when it happened I think was really thoughtful and then his statements going forward up until now have been really thoughtful I feel like he's really understands I feel like he really understands what he did I feel like he's uh, talked to his victims I feel like he's I feel like he's made it right honestly and I think he's I don't know I, I have a lot of respect for him still I know I know a lot of people don't uh, I know a lot of people listening to this will disagree with me Um yeah, but that's that's kind of where I'm at with the Louis C.K. thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think, yeah, it, it's weird because when when you said, I mean, really, even if we hate, even if we were both saying like, well, I I don't, you know, I think he's he should probably duck out and never return, and you know, because what he did was disgusting. I think we're both going to secretly listen to his next comedy special, right? Well, like, you know, that's yeah, he's insanely good, and that, that's another right. question, right? Or another thing that we could talk about is uh, separating artists' art from artists' personal actions, right? So it's yeah. like let's think about, um, you know, 
uh, what's a good like you know Led Zeppelin's music versus Led Zeppelin as human beings because like this is one thing that uh, Ill Gates brought up in uh, our in our podcast when we're talking about the bass nectar stuff he was like Bob Marley was openly homophobic you know Led Zeppelin Motley Crue and stuff like that did horrible shit to underage women very yeah. openly much worse than David Bowie nectar. is is a yeah, good example for, right yeah. and it's like do we separate the art that these people made, which was almost objectively amazing from them themselves, these horrible, or these people who did horrible shit. Hmm. It's, yeah, it's, I'm, I feel like some people can't, you know, I feel like some people can't separate those things. I feel like some people are really, um, like, uh, I feel like I shouldn't, I like my wife, for example, I feel like when she likes a musician, she kind of studies a bit on like what it, what there is to know about their personal life, where they live, what they're into, things like that. And I feel like she sort of connects connects with them that way and connects with the music a little bit stronger. And I feel like if, you know, she found out that that person was like a racist or, you know, a rapist or, you know, uh, it, it probably would make the music sound a little different. I could see that being the case, or it can make like the jokes sound not as funny. Like, could you? Yeah. Mm, that's a good question. Could you ever laugh at Michael Richards again? I don't know. Who like that after is. that, the Seinfeld Kramer guy. Oh uh, yeah. What, so what? What did he do? I don't think I. I don't think I. <laughs> he, he's caught like up to that he. Anymore. He's the synthrotech of comedians. Um, he. Uh, so he basically got it was like in the early two thousands, mid two thousands. He had this stand-up career that was kind of like riding on the Seinfeld thing after Seinfeld ended. And he was at the Laugh Factory, I believe, in L.A. And his set, basically some people came in in the middle of the set, some some, some black people came in in the middle of the set, and uh, were ordering food. That Apparently they were like ordering drinks or whatever, and they were talking over his set. And he w- he like said something to them, and they like ignored him, and then he just screamed the n-word at them whoa repeatedly Re- yeah repeated uh, holy shit repeatedly and i don't remember exactly what he said but you know he said something like you know 100 200 years ago you'd be working in a field holy something fuck. like that Jesus Christ. and if you watch his stand-up comedy you can tell that he is really just trying too hard to rectify a set that was bombing and going to a place that he shouldn't have gone to. And you could tell that the moment he does it, he's like doubling down, trying to just hopefully get a laugh before he starts on fire on the stage. You know what I mean? Like it's, you could see him, his career ending and you know, he knows it, you know, and it's, it's this very fucked up thing. And of course the audience is just like, what the fuck? And everybody leaves. And then he, walks oh, off shit. the stage. He, you know, he tries to save it a couple times. He's like, see, this stuff shocks you. And then it doesn't really work out. And then he's like, and then he just walks off the stage and that's the end of it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that was like, that was massive. I don't think after that, even though like to a point, I, I know that it wasn't about him feeling like he was a member of a superior race genetically. <laughs> I don't think it was about that, but, I, I don't think I could really enjoy a comedy set from him. Yeah, that's, but that's a little. Yeah, I think it depends on like how bad the crime is. Um, by the way, is Michael Richards the guy who played Colonel Klinger in Mash, or is that a different person? No, no, different. <laughs> yeah, different guy. Yeah, right. different generations. I think. Yeah. yeah so um, I, I think it's uh, like, for instance, if Louis C.K. was like a Harvey Weinstein level rapist, yeah. right? Like, I don't think I'd support him anymore. But he wasn't, and he's not. And, you know, if, uh, yeah, I, I really think it depends on, like, the severity of yeah. of what they did. And and also, it's a balancing act, right? Because it's, like, the severity of what they did versus, like, how good they are and how much I enjoy their thing. Like, for instance, Louis, I really love his comedy. I, I've loved it for years. I think he's the best stand-up comedian alive and potentially of all time. Uh, maybe a close, you know, tie with maybe Bill Hicks or George Carlin or something like that. Um, yeah. And I think what he did 
was not nothing, but I don't think it was like severe enough to sort of outweigh that likeness. Whereas, you know, someone like Michael Richards, and, you, know, you know, I like yeah. Seinfeld, but I really don't give a shit about his stand up. I really don't give a shit about the character Kramer in Seinfeld that much, honestly. I think like yeah. George Costanza is the best character in Seinfeld. Um, and, you know, to take something like that, where he's like, you know, someone I don't really give a shit about that much anyway, versus what he did, which seems very severe, yeah. fucking horrible from what it sounds like. Um, <clears throat> no, I don't think I would like ever be able to support Michael Richards again. It, it's funny. The only time I've ever seen him make a public appearance after that was on Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's crazy that Larry David would like still have him after that. Well, Larry David basically had him like he was. It, there's a season where Larry David's like planning a Seinfeld reunion, and he Michael Richards part of it. And basically, like, Larry David, like, tries to convince Michael Richard that he doesn't have a disease that he thinks he has by having um, Leon, I think. It's, it's his black roommate. Like, Larry David lives with the black guy in the show. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and basically, at the end of the episode, it has, like, Michael Richard and his, like, first first TV appearance since then, really, uh, just freaking out in public at this black guy. And everybody like taking pictures with their phones and him being like, no, no. And that's sort of like the whole running joke of like the thing. And so I, I felt like Larry David wrote it in very well. Like he, you know, but his career is still over. So, yeah. So yeah, that, wonder, that's another interesting. Uh, paid him for that bit or if he's like, you can come on and do it, but you're not getting any money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Man, it's interesting because like, yeah, with, I, I think so much of that is normalized too. Like with, when hearing about like the base nectar thing, like that, that's sadly, I just feel like that's so, it doesn't make it any better, but it, it really is so common. And I truly feel like 15 years ago, 10 years, I feel like a lot of times if I heard these things privately, I didn't hear it from the victims. If I just heard it from like, oh, you know, this guy does this, or this guy has this habit, or, you know, this guy's kind of shitty with women, I probably would just be like, oh, that's gross. You know, and and I feel and and I mean to be totally candid, I feel kind of, in a way, I feel kind of bad about that because it's like, fuck, this is so normalized, and I've kind of like the George Floyd thing too, right? It's like it just seems at this yeah. point that it's become normalized for cops to kill black people as well. Right. I mean, I I'm thinking back to like tours I've been on, like especially early on in like 2000, you know, 2004, 2005, where I'd meet some girl at a show and I, I'm such, you know, I'm just anxious about like how early I have to wake up the next day and I'm, you know, I want to respond to emails and I want to eat cinnamon toast crunch and I have like, you know, I've, I'm, I'm like fucking have my own like neurosis, neurotic behavior. And, but it's funny because I've been like repeatedly, I remember on like two different tours, I had been repeatedly teased about being gay because I wasn't slaying chicks that I could have and it was like I was actually embarrassed about it I was like yeah maybe I have some I, I know you know I don't think I'm gay but I know I have maybe I have some sort of maybe I'm asexual or something that's how normalized it is to where like not taking advantage of like my position at the time actually got ridicule from some of my peers <sighs> So it's it's weird. It makes me feel bad uh, for that being one of along the many the many things I thought when hearing when like listening to your podcast um, and listening to what uh, Dylan was describing previous to that because you know the whole thing. I, I know that Bass Nectar is such a huge deal. I, I don't personally listen to him, but I know that he's like he's like the biggest, the biggest. electronic music artist going at the moment, yeah. or he was. Um, yeah, I think this stuff has been pretty normalized, but I think we're in a really good time for reform of the industry, so it could be a little less normalized, you know? Yeah. Which I think is, is good. I, I Well, it's obviously good, but yeah, I, I, I really do see change happening in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, at least it's a lot of people are talking about these issues. You know, I really think uh, the issue with uh, cops killing people especially people of color and musicians being womanizers 
uh, yeah. two conversations that have definitely been started now, which is good. Yeah. It's going to take a series of successful conversations to solve the problems, but... Yeah. And it, it really, to me, it depends. Hmm. To me, it kind of depends who's driving them. It, it's like, like with the race one, at least it, I don't know. It, it's, it's weird to like say this. It's weird to like word these things publicly. Cause you, you want to be careful not to like hurt anyone's feelings. You want to be careful not to say something that might be in, seen as insensitive. Um, not for my own preservation, but just like, I don't want, I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. Um, I, a lot of the online rhetoric about the protests and about Black Lives Matter and stuff like that, I'm going to be completely honest. And I think that like a bunch of white people living in an overwhelmingly white place, sh- sharing nonstop quotes on their Instagram stories and, and, you know, sharing memes and that being... The, and, you know, maybe even buying a Black Lives Matter shirt. I think that being their, like, contribution to the whole thing is not enough. And I I could never understand what it's like to be a black person. But I imagine just from friends of mine, from what they've said, that it's awkward. It's weird to see a 20-something-year-old white dude from Portland screaming at them about what their rights are and how mad they are about, you know, like, I, I think that there's a disconnect and it, and it made me think kind of in living here in Atlanta where like, you know, white people are, are the minority it really made me think, like, I, I thought to myself, like, I would be kind of uncomfortable wearing a black lives matter shirt, not because I don't support the cause. Of course I support the cause, but it's so fucked up to like walk into a grocery store and, and, Wear a shirt that says like, hey, black person, your life matters. Like, you, that's so fucked up. Do you think it feels Isn't maybe it? kind of similar to, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you ever had this experience when you were younger where like, I don't know, something bad happened to you and then you went home and told your mom about it and she was like, I'm going to take you and down to where the bad thing happened and tell the bad person. Yeah. Like, and and you're kind of like standing there next to your mom, like all awkward and shit. Like, oh, fuck, it doesn't matter that much, mom. Like, have you ever yeah. had that experience? I, I I think I can. Yeah, in some way or another, I can I can I can identify. And do you I think mean, that's potentially like somewhat similar to how black people feel about what white people are doing? I, I'm sure some are. I I mean, I I don't think you know. Obviously, black people aren't like one giant brain that thinks one giant emotion. Like right. it's yeah, you know, see. everyone has different thoughts. I think some probably feel that way. And I think some other ones, pro- I, I think there has to be something surreal about a bunch of white people wearing clothing and sl- sharing slogans, telling people that, th- that it would bother them if they were murdered. Right. That's like fucking crazy. And, mm. and the argument to that, the devil's advocate to that could be, well, it shouldn't have to be said, but it does. And it's like, well, there's different, different people have different civil rights leaders. And like, you know, not every, <laughs> not every black person is, has like the exact same politics. And it, some of the, like my, my best friend growing up and my best, best friend currently, he's probably, he's prob- probably closer to libertarian than anything. He's a black guy. And, you know, like he's uh, if you like look at the history of like Clarence Thomas or somebody like Clarence Thomas, for he's a Supreme Court justice. Clarence Thomas, for example, his uh, he believes he's he's kind of Bush appointed him and he has this very extreme, almost Malcolm X born belief that like he's super against affirmative action, for example. He's super against that uh, because he thinks that. What affirmative action is white people sort of just giving black people the crust of the bread, like being like, okay, we'll give you this. Like, you're not actually going to have any power that racism is still going to exist. He, for example, Clarence Thomas believes that racism in white people is in the roots. It can't just be unlearned. Like it's in the roots and that that sort of discrimination is going to to exist as long as 
the power dynamic is where it is. And so he is a, and I'm not saying I agree with Clarence Thomas or disagree with Clarence Thomas, but for example, he's just very capitalistic. He's a, he's a huge capitalist because he believes that black people should embrace capitalism, stick to their own communities, actually segregate a little bit financially, and then become a bigger uh, power vacuum and then have the same amount of power that white people have. And then they'll get the respect because they they control the same amount of wealth and property and those things. And I mean, of course, you could say, like, look what happened in Tulsa. They've tried that before. But that's what Clarence Thomas believes, for example. And I think there's a lot of good merit to that. I think that's actually a pretty good, that's a good argument. I, I'm, I can't say if it's right or wrong. And there's a lot of things that Clarence Thomas believes that's kind of fucked up. But um, yeah, hearing him argue what his idea of black rights are is drastically different than what you hear uh, people, white guys saying on Facebook. Right. And so it's, it's kind of like, I, I guess there's been more than a few times where I've seen people tell, how do I say this, man? Like in earlier in the year, I watched the people of my state, the, the, you know, in the democratic primaries, I watched, uh, the people in the South, the people of South Carolina, um, the, you know, the black voters and the black voters in the Southeast in general, be called low information voters because they didn't vote for a more progressive candidate because they didn't vote for Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. And uh, and so they're essentially called stupid. They don't know what's best for them. And nobody ever stopped. Like I never once heard the argument where like, you know what, maybe, maybe the average African-American isn't concerned about their college debt because higher education is not on the plate for them as much as it is for an upper middle class white kid. Like maybe their number one concern is, you know, it, <laughs> is getting this racist maniac out of the White House more so than, you know, paying off a degree that they don't have uh, from, you know, from, from an institution that may not be welcoming to them in the first place. And so I, I think that, I guess what I'm trying to say is that like, you can see you can see racism everywhere, and I, I feel like there is no real owning it. And within that, not even really owning everything, I think all I think every single one of us has to like identify where we have our own racial issues, where like we you know. And what I'm seeing is a big woke fest, like in a lot of cases. I'm seeing a lot of people just being competitive with how not racist they are. And it's like, that's not going to help at all. Like, that's actually going to hurt things, in my opinion. And that hurt things in, I'm not going to name names, but even in that fundraiser I did, that that hurt things where, like, people were dropping out because there weren't more black people to be on the screen with them. And it's like, you, so you took money. You, you essentially, like, drew money away from this cause that was actively helping the problem because you wanted to be seen with more black people. Like, so what side are you even on then? Like, well, what is this about? This isn't about like actual r civil rights. This is just about you looking like it's about, I don't know. Right. It's like an optics thing where they just like want right. to see. That like word a... was used by multiple YouTubers with right. me. Well, optics. Yeah. And, and it made me sick. And I, and I've like since not spoken to either of them. I've just been like, I fuck, have, how can I even continue having any sort of professional relationship with you? Yeah, I was really glad that Chandler came on. I thought he had a lot of good shit to say. and Absolutely. Was, yeah, that was great. And I thought in general, yeah, that stream was amazing. It's fucking crazy that you raised almost 10 grand for the ACLU. It was more than that. It was 11 at the end of the whole thing. I think it was 11, 11,600. Yeah, something like that, 11,600 hours. Um, and then the ACLU came forward uh, and asked us how we wanted it spent. Like, do you want this to go towards directly towards what's going on right now with the protests or do you want this to go towards our general fund? And so, you know, we were able to actually have it go towards um, defense for protesters and uh, towards, you know, but essentially I'm, I'm sure it's still, they tell you still definitely involved with like federal, federal troops being involved in localized crime and things like that. But, uh, yeah, I, overall, I, I just, uh, 
I don't know. It just makes me wonder, like, I, I don't have an answer. And it's one of those things where, like, I don't like complaining about things if I don't have a better idea. You know, like, I don't like being like, no, they're doing it wrong because I, I don't really know what a better idea is. And, but, but I have been like reading about things like Clarence Thomas and stuff like that and just being like, well, all right, well, what are some of the ideas that aren't from the loudest and most progressive white people? <laughs> like, what are some ideas that are from like actual, you know, people in positions of power who are of color? Right. Yeah. That's um, probably what's, what makes more sense for sure. Hey, man, it's like midnight. So yeah. I think I'm going to go make some overnight oats. That's been my breakfast of late and uh, yeah. eat some trazodone that sounds and go good. to sleep. That's a, another thing I've noticed with the Wellbutrin is uh, I can't sleep as well unless I have something to help me sleep, which has been another drug, trazodone. Dude, this is the weird, like uh, going back to, to the mental health shit again. It's funny to me or it seems ironic to me that they're like, hey, let's fix your drug problem with more drugs. And then it's like the drugs that they give you cause side effects. So you need more drugs to solve those. Like for instance, um, Duncan Trussell has a really funny joke about this. He's like, you know, America has a problem because uh, a drug pharmaceutical drug problem, because you see these billboards everywhere, like uh, with ads on them saying, uh, here's a pill that will get rid of your constipation from taking oxys or yeah. whatever it is. It's like, if you need, if you have a whole like, if that's being advertised to people, you know, that's, um, it's clearly a problem. It's, it's funny because Wellbutrin is commonly prescribed. It's pretty commonly prescribed for people who have like sexual side effects from SSRIs. Right. Um, that's apparently one of the. Labels. Also apparently, uh, given to people who want to quit smoking. Yeah. That, that's actually how it was first, uh, legalized for prescription was for an, a smoking cessation aid and then it ended up they're like oh this also works really well as an antidepressant that has barely any side effects um but it's great that you've you're you've gotten on top of this thing the, the hardest part is like actually being like oh i have to go to a psychiatrist and then like you know admitting that you dude i have to go to not only a psychiatrist i have to go to meetings and shit now really yeah it's good though it's good i mean i enjoy the meetings to be honest um yeah, yeah. so uh, you get to talk to a bunch of at first when i started going to them i was like i'm not like these people these people are you know yeah. I'm, I'm like had this idea like not that i was better than these people but i was different you know like i had this sort of terminal unique kind of approach to the whole thing um but the more i be in these meetings and talk to these people the more i realize i'm just suffering a really common problem that a lot of people have yeah and a lot of times it seems like when i read about when I read, yeah, when I read about other people, I, I've, I haven't, like, there's not, unfortunately, there's not, like, a deep derealization support group but um, <laughs> that, that I've ever heard of. But, like, when I've when I've read about it, yeah, I've sort of had the same thing, and then I realized that it's really just, like, a bunch of different paintings with the same colors and canvas. <laughs> it's right. like, it's, like, just a bunch of different, like, people from different areas in life experiencing the same symptoms as a result of, like, a similar situation or a similar, similar bring up. Uh, but... Yeah, I'm I'm glad that you've I'm glad that you've got that sorted out. I'm glad you bought a house. I mean, it really seems like your life just like took this massive bend into the right direction into a sunny place. Yeah, I think so. Actually, funnily enough, I the place I moved is called the Sunset. Oh, nice. Well, there you go. Riding off in the sunset. Well, um, out of uh, just out of curiosity, what are your what are your thoughts on like being in America if Trump like just decides not to leave office or you know somehow wins really in an odd way yeah um like, well my other option is australia right and yeah it's honestly not much better i don't think like yeah. politically if you look into it it's pretty fucked as well uh yeah. and also i just i don't know i don't i don't really like there's not a lot for me in australia like my family's there but i honestly don't have an an amazing connection with them no, I've never, yeah. never really had a super good relationship, I feel like, with my my parents or my brother. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's just I have a lot of friends there that I miss and would like to see. And I would like to see my family again, for sure. But apart from that, it's like the music scene there is kind of not that good. Uh, you've, yeah. you've basically got Sydney and Melbourne, and that's about it. Uh, and I don't know. Yeah, I just say I, I never – moving to America, I just – 
I just felt like, oh man, this is the place where like, it really is the land of opportunity, right? It's like the, com- yeah. compared to Australia, like coming here, I was like, holy shit. Like I can, there's so many people I can connect with here doing similar shit. And there's so, yeah. so many ways I can see to just like climb the ladder of music and just keep doing better and more interesting stuff here. Whereas in Australia, it's almost like, it's not like I ever hit the ceiling in Australia. I just felt like, I don't know, I didn't, I couldn't like see a, path for what i was doing as clearly in australia because it's just you can like go far in australia right like flume is australian he's fucking huge um yeah but he's making like you know this very weird pop centric stuff that gets played on radio stations there like triple j and fbi and all that stuff and um you know i don't i do pretty experimental weird shit and in america there's a market for that uh in australia there's just not yeah yeah well, it's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I I only ask just because like I'm 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 deeply rooted American. Like I'll 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 fight in a civil war. I'll I'll you know I'll defend it till its end. I'm 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 not one of those like I'm moving to Canada people. Um, yeah, I'm that- kind of with you, man. Like I I'd be down to defend the rights of Americans yeah. for sure, even though I'm not American. I mean, I might be soon if I end up marrying my girlfriend or something. Yeah, um, yeah, but but it's interesting because it's it's been like a topic that's been coming up with my English wife, where she, where we're just like, what are we going to do with Trump? And I'm like, I don't know, man. I think I'm going to fight in the Civil War here. Sorry, seems Sorry, like you're, you're in the right place but, to do it, man. You're in the South. Yeah, so. I ain't fighting for <laughs> Boris Johnson. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Well, I'll let you get your oats and your sleep, and I should probably get mine too. It's like 3 a.m. here, but yeah. that's nothing new. I'm going to go play the pedal steel now. I'm going to go say <laughs> I'm going to go to bed, and I'm going to go play the pedal steel for two hours. But, yeah. All right, man. Well, it was nice talking to you. Yeah, I covered a lot of nice controversial topics today, so that's okay. good. All right. All right. I'll send you the file. All right. <laughs> See you later. Hey, thanks for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. These episodes are edited and uploaded twice a week by Robert Fumo of 303podpro.com. You can also support the show, get early access to episodes and hear bonus content by going to patreon.com forward slash Mr. Bill's tunes and becoming a patron. Uh, Please rate and review on iTunes unless you're going to be a little shit about it. And all the links to my various platforms are at mrbillstunes.com. Thank you.